Good morning, everybody. It is 9 a.m. Mountain Time. Um, we do have quite a few people still trickling in here, so I think I will wait just another minute or two to get started. All right. Good morning again, everybody. Uh, welcome to day four. You know, it's been a long week of a lot of presentations and hands on practice, and we're glad that you continue to join us along the way here. Um, it's great to see everybody again. And by see, I obviously mean virtually see your names in <laughs> black squares across my screen. Um, we today we're going to spend a lot more time talking about the Git, Git and the code management repositories, um, those kinds of things, and get into a little bit more about what it means to be a developer as part of the UFS. And so hopefully you'll find this uh, useful. We obviously want to encourage all of you to kind of go down this path and become uh, further developers as we go into the future. So uh, we're going to start off this morning with Mike Kavulich talking about code management and making contributions to the UFS short range weather uh, using Git and GitHub. So uh, Mike, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Jamie. Um, right off the bat, uh, can everybody see my mouse? Because I, I think I'll be pointing at various things. We can, yep. OK, perfect. Um, so yeah, good morning. Uh, like Jamie said, I'm Mike Kavulich, and I'll be talking to you about <coughs> code management and making contributions to the you have a short range weather app using Git and GitHub. And uh, so I'll just say off the bat, this is gonna be a very densely packed talk that tries to cover a lot. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Git and GitHub um, and are interested in contributing in any way to the UFS, I would encourage you to revisit this talk later. Um, like we've said before, we'll be sending out links to these slides so you can reference them in the future. And again, these talks are being recorded so you can watch them again in the future. Um, with all that said, um, here's the uh, kind of outline of what I'm going to try to cover. Um, first, we're going to get into uh, version control and uh, what that is, and also Git software and GitHub. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about uh, the UFS short range weather app structure and uh, specifically submodules and managed externals, and we'll describe what those are. And finally, uh, get into the, the meat of the subject. So making and contributing co changes to the UFS code. Um, changing code for development purposes, for your personal purposes, but also contributing code back to individual repositories. So let's begin by talking about version control, Git and GitHub. Um, I've already used a term that some of you might be uh, unfamiliar with. Uh, so what is version control and why do we need it? Well, uh, without version control, um, code development uh, whether for an individual or in a team setting, uh, can be a slow divergent pro process uh, with lots of potential for problems. So keeping track of an official version of the code once you've made modifications to the released code, um, it relies on outside communication or naming conventions um, as shown in this demonstratory uh, image on the side here. Um, but it also comes along with problems with difficulty remembering when changes were made and by whom. Um, working with multiple changes simultaneously is almost impossible, and figuring out when and how a bug was introduced is also nearly impossible. And so uh, it's been developed and decided over the years that a better system than this is needed. And so version control software 
has been developed to enable users to uh, do things such as keep track of the authoritative version of the code in a central location, track changes made to the code, um, allow multiple individuals or groups to make changes to the code independently, and to recognize and resolve when conflicting changes are made. <clears throat> so what is version control? Um, so version control software simply tracks the history of changes to the files. In other words, it keeps track of different versions of a file or files as they're modified over time. Um, there's mostly uh, three different types of version control. Um, there's linear version control, and most of you should be familiar with a very basic version, which is uh, in Microsoft products, Microsoft Word and Google Docs. Um, if you make a change and you hit the undo button and later on you say, oh, I actually wanted that, hit the redo button, that's a type of version control. It's a very simple version, but it is version control. Um, then there's way more complicated versions, which are uh, software such as Subversion, which is so-called centralized version control. And then finally, there's Git, which is an example of distributed version control. And that's the one that we're going to be talking about today. <clears throat> Um, it's important to note in this context, what we're tracking is simply plain text files, such as source code, run scripts, documentation. We do not track uh, binaries, executables, data, videos, um, large files like that. We're basically tracking plain text files in 99% of the use cases. So while others do exist, uh, version control software that we use for the UFS and the one I'll be describing today is Git. And Git version control was a software that was developed for use by the Linux project. And it's decentralized for a uh, variety of version control. So that means that rather than a single central copy of uh, a code repository, and we'll describe what a repository is shortly, um, where all changes must be handled, this means that everyone has an equally valid copy of the entire repository. And I know this sounds complicated, and it can be, um, but the standard workflow, um, so-called Git flow, that is used by most UFS components keeps everything organized in a way where everyone can tell what's going on. Now, among the many advantages of this system are that it's uh, simple to track local development, even for minor changes, so you don't have to phone home to a main repository every time you want to make a simple change. Um, and in, related to that, internet access is not needed for active develop until it's time to actually move those changes elsewhere. And it also makes uh, that inadvertent changes can be undone very easily. And it's good that the, the, reason, the main reason that we use Git in the UFS project is because it's by far the most dominant version control system in the software community at this point. Uh, in 2018, almost 90% surveyed software developers preferred it as their preferred method of version control. So how does Git work? Well, a self-contained bunch of tracked code is known as a repository. And I'm going to use the term code in this presentation as a shorthand for any files tracked by Git. Um, it's basically any type of text file, um, usually code, but it can also be documentation and scripts and things like that. Um, Git repositories, they can be created from scratch, but uh, we'll focus on existing code in this presentation because that's what the UFS is, it already exists. And those of you who are, in, who are using, doing the practical sessions this week um, have already used Git at least once um, when you first retrieved the UFS short range weather app repository. And this is the command that you used. So these are the, the three main parts of this command broken down. Um, there's the git clone command, which cre creates a clone or a local copy of an existing repository. Um, that repository is at the end here, you can see it's a URL. Um, that points to the location of the short range weather app repository on GitHub. The GitHub website is something I'll describe later on in the presentation. And finally, there's that second part of the command and that checks out a branch, or in this case, a tag, which I'll describe again in the future, uh, named UFS v, uh, 1.0.1. Uh, sorry, there's a typo there. Um, you can try any of these commands in the presentation at home if you like. Since git clone gives you a full copy of the repository, you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. So the history of changes made to the code is tracked by telling git to save the current state of the code every so often. 
And a git save point is known as a commit. And this is a, a term that we will widely use in uh, code development. Um, each commit uh, contains a bit of information. So it's, uh, it contains the actual text of the code that was changed. Um, it contains a commit message, which is uh, what you will type in or the person who made the commit will type in that describes the change. And a SHA-1 hash that uniquely identifies the commit um, and the commit history going up to that point. And now there are a few commands that you'll want to be familiar with in order to kind of navigate your way around Git. And the first and foremost, uh, the, probably the most useful one that I'll describe is git log. And the git log command uh, gives you a list of all commits since the repository was created. And here's just an example of what that output looks like. Um, it shows you the SHA-1 hash that I described. Um, and it gives you kind of the author and date information and also the message that was typed in when that commit was made. And here you can see it's just a description of the changes that were made. A few other useful commands uh, I'll describe will help you create commits. So you create a commit by modifying code, uh, staging that code for commit, and then commit it. So this is done uh, with a few commands. So the git status command um, after you've made changes within a Git repository, um, these can be, again, any sort of changes to either a readme file or code or even creating a new text file. And the Git status command shows you uh, files that were different from what Git has in its ledger. Um, again, in this example, two files have been modified and one new one has been created. Uh, there's a up here, you can see this line tells you what branch you're on. We'll get to what that means later. Um, Git has recognized that there are a couple of files that have changed. And it's also know that, noticed that there is an untracked file here that it does not know about. And uh, a good thing about Git commands is that a lot of them will let you know what you might want to do next. So here you can see that there's a few different Git commands that it says, so if you want to make an update or if you want to uh, add these files, um, it gives you kind of a cheat sheet uh, to let you know what you might want to do next. Um, now, the git status only showed us the files that have been changed. But if we want to see exactly what those changes are, because if you're working with, if you're developing and making changes to the code, you may kind of lose track of exactly what you've changed. You can use the git diff command. And that will show you exactly the changes that have been made. And um, you can see I've added some very important uh, variables and comments in here. Um, and it looks like the kind of comment that I want to make for this commit. So that looks good to me. Um, you can use git add to, once you have made these modifications, so-called stage that file for commit. So for new files, uh, you add git add to stage them for commit. Um, in other words, git add tells git the changes you want to track. If you don't use the git add command, git is not going to keep track of those changes until you do. Um, there's a few related commands such as git rm, which will remove files. Um, and you can use git add on full directories or even use wildcards, but this is strongly discouraged um, because it's very easy to accidentally commit files that you don't want to commit, um, which can cause unintended consequences further down the line. And so now that I've used the git add command, you can see that I do the git status command again, and it now lists these as changes to be committed. And finally, we can use git commit, which is the command that will actually create the commit. Um, and this should, when you run the git commit command, it should bring up a text editor for you to enter this commit message so you can uh, kind of make a message that lets people know what the uh, changes that you made are. Um, a commit message for your own changes, it can be as brief or detailed as you like, but it really should be enough to give you a rough idea of what was changed and why. Okay, so I told you that I'd talk about branches. Um, so far we've described just making uh, commits and and keeping track of them. Um, and the simplest type of Git repository will consist of a single linear history all the way back to its creation. Um, however, um, 
when you're working with multiple people or even on multiple different projects at the same time, it's useful to have the ability to work on multiple changes in parallel. And Git allows, and it really encourages uh, the so-called branch functionality. And this can be used for parallel, parallel development of different capabilities or fixes in the code at the same time. Um, it can be used to separate, it can also be used to separate the code that's undergoing active development from that that is being tested for a release, for example, or being kept stable for some other purpose. If you never change anything, all the commits are gonna go to the main branch by default. Um, this is often kept as the authoritative version of the repositories or the project's code. Uh, most UFS components use uh, the name develop for their main branch. Some uh, use the term main for their uh, main branch. The short range weather app release that we've been using this week is on a so-called release branch. So it's on these branches named release slash public V number. In this case, it's V1 because this was version one of the short range weather app release. Um, now the name of the branch, it doesn't typically matter at least from a technical standpoint. Um, it's just for human readability. And if you're working on the command line and you want to create a new branch, um, you would use the git checkout dash b command um, to just create whatever branch name you want. Um, and it's really good practice to always create a new branch when making changes to the code that you will need to keep. So this is the simple linear non-branching way of tracking changes that I described at first. And this is kind of what the branching model looks like. Uh, the specifics aren't really important, but the point is that commits can be applied to different branches and these commits can be merged from one branch to another. Um, you'll also notice that I've pointed out these fancy things labeled tags here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, each git commit has a unique 40 character hash that identifies it. It's unique, which is a good thing, but it's not very memorable. And so git tags are a way to allow a hash to be referenced in a human readable way. Um, and these can be checked out just like branches. Um, essentially tags are just an easily referenced permanent snapshot of the code. Um, git tags are usually created by repository managers for important events. For example, an official code release. And actually the, uh, the tag that we've been checking out this week, version 1.0.1, um, that's the bug fix release that just came out in the past week for this uh, tutorial. Um, tags can also be used for various other purposes, um, such as a stable, well-tested version of the code, or to reference a specific event in the past of the repository that should be preserved for some reason. And I just want to emphasize that Git is, uh, you really should know how to use Git, even if you don't plan on developing uh, or contributing code back to the repository anytime soon. Um, it really is very useful. And I wish somebody had told me about version control and using Git when I was in grad school. Um, there's a lot of different commands. It's an incredibly powerful tool and we can really only scratch the surface today. Um, and there's, I put some more information here. Like I said, I hope that you'll uh, reference this presentation in the future um, if you have questions about how to use it and how Git can be useful to you. So now that we've talked about Git, and hopefully you understand it a little better, um, we need to address the other half of the picture. Uh, what is GitHub? So GitHub is a website specifically for hosting and maintaining Git repositories, as well as collaboration testing and documentation tools revolving around those Git repositories. Um, like Git itself, GitHub is widely used in the software development community. There are other uh, repository hosting websites out there, but the UFS project is settled on GitHub. <clears throat> uh, and it allows uh, for many additional capabilities on top of the built-in Git functionality, such as forks, pull requests, uh, issue tracking, uh, wikis, et cetera. I'm gonna get into all those in the coming slides. So if you visited the uh, URL for the short range weather app that we've advertised, um, you'll see something like this. So it's uh, this is what it, GitHub looks like in your web browser when you view the short range weather app repository. 
Uh, GitHub and the tools that it offers are really essential to the development process for the app. So you should be somewhat familiar with what can be found on these pages. Um, you can see kind of in the top left, you can see there's a drop down list of branches and you can click on this and see all the different branches that are available. Um, there's a browsable directory structure of the code repository. So you can actually go through and see all the code and uh, click on it through the web interface and even uh, see the history of each individual file and changes that have been made over time. Um, and you can do that um, by clicking over here where it says the number of commits to browse the revision history of the log. So this is analogous to the git log command that you use on the command line. Um, but this shows you even more information because you can kind of see uh, how it connects to different pull requests. And again, I'll describe what that means later. Um, so as I mentioned, even if you don't plan on doing any development, there are useful tools uh, that you can find on GitHub. And GitHub Issues is one of those tools. So the GitHub Issue Tracker is a great tool for communication with other collaborators on a given repository. Um, an issue is simply just a numbered message that's associated with the repository. Um, but typical reasons for opening an issue include pointing out a bug in the code or requesting a feature. Um, that doesn't exist yet or doesn't exist to uh, your uh, what you need it for. And typically an issue will consist of a title that briefly describes the issue, uh, followed by more detailed text. And this is kind of what the uh, issues page for the short range weather app looks like. Um, you can see that there's kind of these, like I mentioned, these numbered lists. Um, and uh, with, it'll show you the title and we can also apply tags that kind of describe what the issue is. In this case, we have a, a few potential bugs that have been pointed out. And here we have uh, an enhancement that's being discussed. So some uh, future contributions and, and developments for the code. <clears throat> and this is what an example issue looks like, including details about the problem, potential solutions and discussion with other developers about the issue. So I've mentioned forks once or twice, and we've heard it a few times in previous talks, but we've not really described what they are. So GitHub allows individuals to keep their own copy of the authoritative repository. And this is known as a fork. Um, a fork, like every other Git repository, is a full standalone repository. It contains the entire commit history with all the branches and tags. Um, and the fork, is stored under your own GitHub account, and you have full permissions to make as many changes as you want without affecting the authoritative repository. Going back again to the UFS short range weather app repository on GitHub, we can actually see that there's a button at the top right labeled fork. And here is where you'd go to create a new fork or to see existing forks. Uh, now, all development and new contributions should come from a user's fork. And this is just for code stability reasons. Um, it's not because we don't trust our users, but it's mainly a way to keep the main repository kind of clean and sanitary. And it kind of allows developers a whole bunch of freedom to make changes that they need uh, and not have to worry about the consequences on other developers while they're making those changes. And if you went to the website and you clicked on the fork button, um, you might see a box asking where the fork should be created. You should change, check your or choose your own username. And once you've done that, um, you will have your own fork. Um, so you can see the same code as you did before. Um, it's just at a different URL. Um, and if you'll always know if you're looking at a fork because you will see that in the top left it says fork from in this case the main repository. Um, and as I mentioned, all development and new contributions should come from a user's fork. This is true not just for external users, but also the core development team. And once your fork is created, uh, in order to do work with the code and make changes to the code, um, instead of cloning the main repository, um, which is the URL we've pointed out in the past, github.com slash UFS community slash UFS short range weather app, um, you will clone your fork. And that's the exact same URL except Instead of UFS community, it will now be your GitHub username. And as I've mentioned, aside from a different URL, working in a clone of your fork is the exact same as working in a clone of the main repository on the command line. 
it, and just as a word of warning, um, as I mentioned, you always want to create a new branch before you make changes to the code. You really don't want to make changes to the main branch or the develop branch. Um, instead, you want to start with the develop branch, which is the main name of the main branch for the short range weather app and most of its components. Um, you want to start with that and actually create a new branch from that code and then make your changes. So a bit of Git that we haven't covered yet. When commits are made, uh, they are initially only on the local clone of your repository. And I uh, feel like I haven't emphasized this enough that when you have your uh, clone of the repository in a single place on the command line, when you make changes there, they are only in that repository unless you explicitly say, I want to move these changes somewhere else, whether that be to, uh, to your fork on GitHub or to the main repository on GitHub. And in order to get these changes back to the main repository on GitHub, you will need to push those commits back to the origin, the so-called origin repository. Uh, and you do that using the git push command. And as the opposite of that, when commits are made by others to the main repository, they don't automatically show up in your local clone of the repository. And so in order to get the most up-to-date code from GitHub, you'll need to pull in those latest commits using the git pull command. So we have push and pull. It's very, very zen in that way. And finally, now that we've talked about git pull, we can talk about the thing that we've mentioned in many presentations so far, and that is a pull request. So if you'd like to make changes to a repository on GitHub, you can do so via this pull request. So pull request is often abbreviated as a PR. Um, it's a request to have your changes pulled into the official repository, usually from your fork. And that's the, the model that we use. Um, a PR can be applied between any two branches in any repository with a common history. But traditionally, they're applied from a fork to the main repository, which is how we use it with the short range weather app. When opening a PR, it's generally expected that you'll provide a description of the changes is a justification for the changes and a summary of the tests conducted that uh, ensure that you've actually made good changes. Um, and different projects have different requirements for the testing that's required and the message that's required when opening a PR. And I'll describe more on that later. Um, this is just a a note, if you have just made a push, a git push to GitHub, um, Git will often give you this handy shortcut um, to create a new pull request. Um, but if not, you would go to the, uh, the web interface and there's a button just above the code that says pull request. And that'll give you uh, more, informa more information and kind of walk you through the process from there. Um, and I'll go, kind of go through the process at the end of this presentation. So, Let's take a breath and uh, remember why we're here to learn about the short range weather app. Um, this section will be brief, um, but it's important to know that, that learning about how, it's important to learn about how all these repositories are connected together. <clears throat> so the UFS short range weather app is composed of a number of individual standalone codes, repositories, uh, most of which were initially independent components. Um, things like the UFS weather model, UPP, um, UFS utils, uh, these all kind of had their own start in different ways and were initially used um, standalone in many cases. So uh, each of these components has its own separate repository and many of these components, such as the weather model especially, have additional subcomponents. And I'll just emphasize this flowchart, not everything is listed here. This is just an example of the uh, spider web of different repositories that there are. Um, here's just an example of uh, looking at the various ways these are connected together. Um, at the top, we obviously have the app. That's the umbrella repository that ties everything together as an end-to-end -end NWP system. Um, below that, we have uh, in this example, the UFS weather model. This is the main repository for the weather model and its components. And below the UFS weather model, we have the FV3 ATM repository. Now this contains the atmospheric component of the weather model. And below that, 
we have, uh, for example, the CCPP physics repository. This contains the GFS and RFS physics schemes that we use in the short range weather app. And uh, in addition, the Atmos Cube Sphere, uh, which is the FE3 dynamical core. So, how are all these repositories linked together? Surely it's a nightmare to keep track of all these changes going into every repository and how they all interact. And it can be, but this is handled through uh, two different utilities, uh, one called Manage Externals and the other called Submodules. So submodules are a native functionality of Git, and that is just a way of uh, linking one repository as a subdirectory to another repository. And uh, Manage Externals is an external tool uh, developed and maintained by a number of people at NCAR and other national labs for use with uh, CESM. Um, and this adds some functionality on top of submodules. And you may have already seen this. Um, there's a, the external repositories are tracked with Manage Externals using this file known as externals.cfg. And that just lists uh, this information about the different repositories. So it shows you uh, what the repository uh, web address is. It shows what uh, tag or branch or hash you'll be checking out. And it shows the uh, location of where you're going to check out the subdirectory where you're going to check out that sub repository. So if you're checking out a single repository, um, say you want to do development just on the weather model and you're not interested in how it fits into the larger app, um, you would have to clone it using the command git clone uh, dash dash recursive. And this gets you the repository that you asked for as well as all the submodules connected to that repository recursively. On the other hand, if you're checking out the entire UFS short range weather app, you issue the uh, regular git clone command, which gets you the weather app repository. And from there, you run the externals utility. And that checks out all the other required submodules recursively. And finally, uh, we've come to the moment you have all obviously been waiting for. How do we make changes to the code? And how can we contribute that code back to the app? So modifying the code of individual repository for the app is relatively easy, um, notwithstanding the problems of actually uh, doing proper programming and things like that. Um, the short range weather app uses a CMake based build system, um, and that allows the easy rebuilding of code after making changes. So for most changes, um, you can just modify the code um, in the source repository. And in our case, this is tracked under the UFS short range weather app slash SRC directory. And once you've made those changes, you can then rerun the make command. And the make utility keeps track of the changed files and only rebuilds the necessary code. Now, for those of you that have already built the UFS weather app, whether um, on your own or in the practice sessions, you will know that uh, typically when you run the make command, it spits out a lot more input than this. Whereas here, I've, made, I've already built the code, but then I made a single change in this case um, to one of the tools under UFS utils. And I ran the make command again, and everything that was already built, make just ignored and, and bypassed. And eventually it got to the point where it found where I made a change to a file, it rebuilt the code from that file, and then moved on. Um, just as a quick caveat, it's not always this simple, but if you're only making changes to, to basic code, it should be that simple. But if you're making changes to the build system or prerequisite libraries, you'll probably need to rebuild from scratch. But I think most people will only be doing development on the actual uh, weather model and utilities and post code. So how do you, once you've made these changes or when you're thinking about making these changes, how would you go about contributing the code back to the UFS? So the first thing you'll need to do is switch to the develop branch on the repository. So, so far we've uh, talked about the release branch and the uh, uh, that's what you've been using in the classroom exercises if you're doing the practice sessions. Um, but the release code, while it's well-tested and very stable, 
Um, this has a downside. That means it's been frozen aside from a few bug fixes since early 2021. So if you're trying to make changes, um, by the time you start your development, even right now, um, the main branch is far ahead of the release branch and is missing a lot of uh, capabilities that we will be uh, learning about in today and tomorrow. Um, now, just running git clone, if you omit the dash b argument that we've used in the practice sessions, that will get you the default branch. And so specifically for the app, in the develop branch, the uh, latest well-tested hashes of each repository are cloned. Um, and these are far more recent than the tags that are used in the release branch. Now, before making changes to any of these individual repositories, you will need to create a fork of the repositories you will be, cha you will be changing. And I mentioned that briefly earlier, but here I'm gonna go into a bit more detail. So the first thing you'll need to do if you're gonna create a fork is you need to create a GitHub account um, or log into an existing one if you already have a GitHub account. They, you'll then need to go to the main repository that you are interested in. In this example, I'm using the UFS weather model. Um, and in the top right, there's a fork button that you can create. You can click to create your fork. And again, once you've done that, you now have kind of this standalone copy of the repository that's the exact same state as when you created the fork, uh, but now you have control over it. It's, you're not gonna, you, you have full permissions to make the changes you need, and you also won't interfere with anyone else's changes. So once your fork has been created, you can then modify, in the case of the app, the externals.cfg file to check out your fork instead of the authoritative repository. Now in this example, I've just created uh, some example. Uh, I, I have my own fork and I've create, made some example changes. And in the externals.cfg file, I've pointed to those changes. So rather than github.com slash UFS community slash regional workflow, I now have my username slash regional workflow. And so now when I run manage externals slash checkout externals, um, this time manage externals will clone the fork that my fork. And if you want to create new branches and commit changes to your fork, uh, you would use the commands described earlier. And finally, you would push your changes back to your fork on GitHub. Uh, now, once your changes are working to your satisfaction and they've been pushed back to your fork on GitHub, you're now ready to open a pull request. So the, uh, the way you do this is you visit uh, your fork on GitHub via the internet browser and you click pull request. And from the drop down menu at the right, um, you'll see this kind of interface. Um, you want to select the branch that you just pushed to your fork or the branch that you're interested in opening a pull request from. In this case, it's named test. Um, after selecting the correct branch, you'll want to click a button that says create pull request. And that will bring up a wonderful text box. And then it's time to actually create the pull request. Um, so most of the UFS repositories actually have a pull request template and that will actually populate this text box with uh, different sections uh, and it'll give you instructions on what information is needed and what you'll wanna actually put in those text box before you actually click create pull request. Um, you'll want to, you'll definitely uh, uh, want to add as many details about the changes as you feel are necessary, um, especially for pull requests that consist of many different commits. Um, and this is where your own commit message history can come in handy. It can remind you of exactly what was changed and, and when and for what reason. Um, and using those descriptive commit messages while you're making changes to your own code um, can make this step a lot less work. Um, for some repositories, the UFS weather model included, um, the message box will be filled in with a template. I already mentioned that. And finally, when you're finished filling in all those details, you can hit create pull request to open the PR. And the process is not over then. So once you've created the pull request, you'll need to be prepared to respond to questions or concerns from code managers and other community members. Um, you can, if changes are requested or changes are required to your code, um, you can make those changes by just adding new commits to the same branch and pushing them to GitHub 
um, pull requests are tied to a specific branch. So when you make changes to that branch, it will update the code that's actually going to be committed once that pull request is merged. Um, and I skipped over one very important part uh, up to this point. So most components of the UFS have some kind of testing system for ensuring that changes to the code are working correctly and do not break existing capabilities. Um, the weather model has a fairly extensive so-called regression testing system. Um, UFS utils repository has an extensive but still developing regression testing system, as well as unit testing requirements. <clears throat> Um, UPP, the Unified Post Processor, has a basic regression testing suite, again, but it's growing rapidly. And regional workflow and changes to the UFS shortened weather app itself are, can be tested with workflow end-to-end -end tests. Now, these tests, um, as I mentioned, each, inter each repository has its own individual requirements. Um, but in almost every case, these tests are going to need to pass before the changes can be accepted into these code repositories. Now you can speed the code review process along by completing tests prior to opening your PR and mentioning in your PR the tests that were conducted. Um, I just want to emphasize that these tests are really not meant to be a burden. We don't want to discourage developers from committing their code back to the UFS, um, the UFS repositories. Um, they're meant to ensure that not only are your changes working as intended, uh, but they're not breaking other capabilities that you may not, you may not even be aware of. Um, and so we definitely encourage you to, when you're going into the process of opening a pull request, um, if you're having trouble uh, running these tests or knowing what tests are required, ask a code manager or developer for help. And these code managers are listed um, usually in the wiki for, that's attached to each individual repository. Um, the example I used above, is for the UFS weather model. But again, different repositories have different requirements for PRs. And uh, I'll detail some of these requirements briefly in the following slides. Um, so first of all, uh, the short range weather app itself, um, it's mainly an umbrella repository. There's not really much uh, code or scripts that are actually contained in that repository, but they do exist, especially for the build system. Um, and so changes for that, and also the regional workflow, which is the scripts that kind of make the workflow run and tie everything together um, and set up your experiments. Um, both of these are, uh, are tested using, as I mentioned, um, these end-to-end -end workflow tests. Um, the requirements for these repositories, um, all code changes need to be submitted via pull requests as with uh, pretty much every UFS repository. Um, they need to come from feature branches on user forks and a feature branch is basically just the uh, the name for a branch where you're creating a new feature. Um, and end-to-end -end tests need to be run on one or more supported platforms for these pull requests to be accepted. Um, we're in the process of developing a more formal testing and code contribution process. Um, I've included some links here to the relevant repository wikis um, that will give you the latest and greatest information once the time comes to actually contribute back. For the UFS utils repository, um, the requirements for contributing code. Um, it requires that an issue be opened prior to opening a pull request. So at, I mentioned issues earlier, and they're not only for um, kind of making note of a bug or requesting a feature, you can also use issues as a way to um, sort of announce that you're working on a feature, um, that a pull request is coming. Um, and that can kind of start the ball rolling on some discussion on you know what sort of testing requirements might be required and uh, what people are interested in um, from these changes that you're uh, kind of proposing. Um, all code changes must conform to NCO implementation standards. That's uh, just uh, the link is required there to get more details on that. Um, and it requires regression testing on a number of platforms and also may require the contribution of unit tests. And uh, I've included links to more information there. For the Unified Post Processor, uh, UPP, also known as uh, EMC Post in the released branch, um, you also should create an issue to describe the change you'll be providing. And then once you open a pull request, you should contact one of the code managers to conduct the regression test for you. And again, I included links to more information on the, on the NOAA EMC uh, wiki. 
CCPP. Uh, you'll learn a bit more about uh, developing for CCPP later this afternoon in Lori's talk. And uh, as I mentioned, there are many other uh, repositories out there. Um, almost all of them should have documentation within the uh, GitHub website or the wiki um, that describes the how you would contribute your code back there. Um, so if you don't see your individual repository that you're interested listed here, um, go to the GitHub website or reach out to one of the code managers listed there. Um, so this is just some uh, basic Git and GitHub documentation that you can go to. Um, and uh, that's pretty much all that I had. Um, and uh, I think I heard some questions, so I'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing and take the questions now. Great. Thanks, Mike. That was an excellent presentation. A lot of really useful information in there. Uh, we had one question come through on the Zoom chat. And so while I ask that, if others are thinking of questions, go ahead and put those in Slack if you wouldn't mind or raise your hand. Uh, the question on Zoom chat is from Geely. I'm just curious, is there a reason to use manage externals on the top level instead of sub modules? Yeah, so this was a uh, design choice that I believe came from the, uh, the overall vision of the UFS um, in general, not just the short range weather app. Um, manage externals was used uh, in the seam workflow for the UFS medium range weather app, which is the global capability. Um, and I believe it's sort of left over from that. So uh, there's a uh, there are some advantages to manage externals, um, but that's the main reason why it why it is included um, in this case. I, I will add one more thing, and that is that manage externals allows you to pull in SVN repositories. And those several years ago, there were some um, repositories for infrastructure libraries and such that were still in SVN, so you can't do that as easily and get submodules. You might be able to do it now, but at that point, that was another factor. Great, all right. Um, I don't see any other questions right now, but I do see a couple of people typing in Slack. So there might be a few more coming. Um, in the meantime, if anybody else has a question, um, feel free to raise your hand and we could take those as well. All right, a couple more coming in here. Um, Aman asks, is there any backlog of the upcoming changes? I um, so yeah, in some repositories, like I believe the, the weather model does this where they will actually um, sort of publish the upcoming changes that are going in and sort of establish an order. I, I can't remember if that's the weather model um, or maybe it was CCPP. Um, that will kind of, before anything is even merged, we'll decide, okay, this change will go in and then this change will go in even uh, before the PR is uh, opened. Um, I think maybe that's the, uh, the question you were asking. Yeah, and it looks like Dom posted a link to um, the commit queue in the Zoom chat. Uh, if, you are, if anybody is curious there, um, but, yes, oh, so and Dom, you right. have your hand raised, so go ahead. Yeah, that's right. So um, the UFS weather model maintains a commit queue. That's the public version of the commit queue um, that gets decided upon every two weeks on Friday when all the UFS code managers meet. And um, then they get put in an order. Sometimes this changes, and of course, uh, the estimated commit date may, may shift as well, depending on how testing goes and so on and so forth. But it's... Um, this is, this is the, the best resource for the public to go to. And then you can just click on that pull request in that, in that list there and you know, the web page that I, that I um, posted to see what the actual change is. And um, one, one detail about it is um, there is a comment column in the very end that says whether it changes results or not. If something does not change results, then it's usually safe and good and easy to combine this with other pull requests that also do not change results because we have just so many that we need to get through. Um, <clears throat> but if something changes results, then we want to keep those changes isolated so that we know exactly which PR did what and we don't you know, commingle result changes by combining different pull requests. 
yeah, thanks for all that that information, Dom. That's that's great. Um, and I will emphasize, yeah, some repositories have that, such as the weather model. Um, other repositories, such as uh, regional workflow and the short range weather app itself, do not have a, a public commit queue, and that's mainly because we uh, just haven't gotten around. We haven't had enough. Uh, development to make this uh, important. So um, it could be that in the in the future, we will enact something like that. But for now, it doesn't exist. So yeah, in the regional work workflow repository, there are a large number of issues that are open um, with varying degrees of prioritization, um, high, medium, and low. And, and so while there's not a commit queue necessarily, there there is a, a backlog of issues that are would, that we would like to address at some point. So another another point there. Um, let's see, another question from David Wright. Great talk. When working on a feature branch of a fork and a git pull command is run, where is the upstream update coming from? Is it the local fork or the dev branch of the main repository? Uh, so these these were some things that I wasn't sure I'd have time to cover, so I put them in bonus slides, actually. Um, so I, I guess I can uh, just go through those really quick, because it looks like I still have 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, once a fork is created, as I've mentioned a few times, it becomes its own independent repository. Um, and changes to the main repository are not going to appear in your fork. Um, so you'll need to keep your fork up to date as you continue development over time. Um, and to address your question specifically, I can come back to this later. Um, while forking has many advantages, it, it does require the extra effort of keeping your fork in sync with the main repository. And this is handled through a, another bit of Git functionality, which is remote repositories. And a remote is simply just a link to another repository. Either it can be on your local disk or it can be uh, on a website, so just GitHub. And when you create a remote link to another repository, um, you can push to and pull from that repository. Um, one remote is automatically created when you create a clone, and that's the origin remote. And that's basically the location where the current repository was cloned from. And um, you can see here, I've used the git remote command to see uh, what the remotes are in my current repository. That was just when I did a basic clone of the main repository. And it shows that the origin is uh, this github.com slash UFS community. Um, in this, this is actually a slide from an old talk. I didn't uh, actually update it, but this was the medium range weather app, but the same is true for the short range weather app. Now, uh, to keep your fork in sync with the main repository, um, you can clone your fork locally and create a new remote named upstream um, that will point to the main repository. Um, and when you do this, um, you can use git fetch uh, upstream to, and again, this is just a, a human readable name. It can be named anything, but this is the standard way that we do things, so there's not much confusion. Um, you will do the git fetch command, which uh, fetches the latest changes, including new, new commits on each branch, as well as new branches. And next, you'll perform a merge on the main repository for the branch. And in this case, um, I just want to uh, do this merge to update my the develop branch in my fork. And this is one of the reasons why we tell you not to do development, not to actually make changes to develop. And that's because in your fork, if you keep develop um, identical to the develop in the main repository, this will always be a, uh, an easy jumping off point for you to make your, uh, make your changes without having to resolve complicated merge conflicts and things like that. Um, and uh, that's, uh, if you, I believe I've answered your question now, um, but basically this is the way that you would keep your changes in sync. And this is mainly important if you're doing development over a long period of time or multiple stages of development. All right, so I do see that Jeff raised his hand. Um, Jeff, do you have something yeah. else to add there? Yeah, I just had a question for Mike related to git fetch and git merge. 
Is that equivalent to get get pull? Because I never do fetch and merge. I always just do pull, and I've always wondered whether uh, I should not be doing that, or if there's a difference between that and fetch and merging. Yeah. So get pull is, as far as I know, exactly identical to doing git fetch and then git merge. Okay. Um, the reason that you would want to do it in separate steps um, is mainly, I guess you'd say for safety reasons, to make sure that uh, you kind of are supervising the changes that are uh, that are happening. And if you get to the git fetch step and stuff happens that you didn't expect, you can uh, address it before the merge process starts. Um, and uh, again, when you when you do a git fetch and then git merge, you could also include the dash dash ff flag, and that will uh, only perform so-called fast forward merges. And so those are merges where um, the repository histories are identical, or the branch histories are identical rather, um, but the branch that you're merging from has extra commits after yours, and that's usually what you'll see on the develop branch. Um, and so using the ff flag will just only pull in extra changes that have come. And if something is different and you'll end up doing a complicated merge where the histories are different, it will it will quit and allow you to uh, figure out why that happened. So if you if you had a dash dash FF, um, then you would not get a merge conflict. That's correct. So if there okay. if the if the histories were in any way different. Uh, using the FF flag, it would just quit and not do anything. And it would tell you these, okay, the history is different. Um, there will be some sort of merge that's required, um, but it won't actually do anything. That's why I like to use the dash dash FF flag because it kind of gives you a heads up um, so that if you do the git merge, uh, you will have to either have a proper git, a proper merge code merge or even resolve some conflicts. Okay, thanks, Mike. Great. Any other remaining questions for Mike? Russell, go ahead. So just very quickly, when you've got a conflict between two people who have made changes and want to uh, commit it back to, say, the development branch, how is that handled? So in general, um, Git is very smart about uh, auto resolving any conflicts. So if you've if you've made a change to one part of the code and someone else made a change to the other part of the code, um, Git will very easily um, through the pull request uh, through the merge process um, just merge these together and say, okay, now we have both changes. Um, clearly, this you, you need to be careful um, when you're dealing with different parts of the system. Um, if you're pulling in changes that may require changes elsewhere in the code, it, it can get complicated. So it's Git, Git cannot you know, know, oh, there, I added this new physics scheme here, but there's no reference to it here. Um, those kind of smart changes obviously can't be resolved by Git. Um, but Git is very good about recognizing if you've made a change and someone else has made a change to the same part of the code, and it will uh, it will kind of pop up dialogue that allows you to resolve those conflicts. So it'll it'll allow you to see, okay, here's the change that this other person made. Here's the change that you made. Now go wild, Mer merge these together the way they're supposed to be merged. Okay. But, but, but who, yeah, sometimes the, 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 the merging will always create a contradiction because two people are trying to do two different things, say with the same variable or something. There must be someone who has to make a decision. Right, and that, sorry if I wasn't clear there. So if if changes are made to the same part of the code by two different people, um, then what will happen is there will be a so-called merge conflict. And you may it depends on whether you're doing a merge on the command line or if this comes up at the pull request step. Um, so a lot of times if you open a pull request and some changes go into the code in between the process when you open the pull request and when you actually got ready to actually submit your changes, um, and then GitHub, in this case, GitHub will actually not allow you to create the merge. It will say, okay, there's, there's been intervening changes in the lines that you're trying to change. And it will uh, basically, uh, you will click a button and say, and it will show you the parts where there's a conflict. So it will show you this section of code was changed by this person. 
here are your changes to that same section of code. And it will ask you to say, OK, what's, what should the final state be? So you get to define the side of the final state. There isn't a moderator who gets to define, to define the final Cor state. Correct. So uh, that will, again, be dependent on the policies for each individual repository. And I, I do see that Dom's hand is up. So about, maybe I'll let him go on from there. I was just going to say the same thing. There is a difference depending on the repository. So for example, most people will make changes in the physics. Um, that's just the place where, where most people are engaged with. And then there is a, there are code managers that assign reviewers and those reviewers will discuss with the, with the um, developer, with the author and with the code managers. Um, what these changes should be. And sometimes um, people high up in the hierarchy, um, like for example, Fang Lin from EMC, then also chime in if there are um, contradicting changes or something like that. All right, great. Yep. Um, well, thank great. you again, Mike, appreciate that. And I just wanted to mention everybody, um, there was a question about when the recordings would be available and um, once we have all of those processed, we will put those onto the agenda page. Um, I have been trying to populate the presentations at the end of each day. So um, later today, I'll try and um, populate Mike's slides, for example, onto the agenda page as well. So go ahead and just keep an eye on that page as we move forward and you should see those updates happening. So, all right, thanks again, Mike. And Jeff, I'll toss it over to you. Thanks, Jamie. So, um, all right, thanks, Mike, for releasing your screen there. Uh, yeah, so again, thanks, Mike, for a fantastic presentation on, on Git and GitHub. Um, we're going to move to Dom, who will be presenting on uh, differences between the release and develop branch, um, not only just uh, the clone, but how to build uh, as well. So, Dom, I'll hand it over to you if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Yes, let me, okay, I think I can do it this way. Um, okay, you should be seeing my slides now. Yep. Is that correct? Okay. We can. I just need to move all this Zoom garbage out of the way. That's, uh, okay, should be fine. Good. Can you um, uh, maximize your screen? Yes, um, I will do that in a second. Hang on. Okay, sure. Um, I will do this for this part of the presentation, but for the walkthrough, we'll just have to live with this with the window okay. as it is. Um, is that better? That's perfect, thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Dom Heinzeler. I am, uh, I introduced myself, myself on Monday, but again, so I'm one of the CCPP developers and I'm also a code manager for the UFS and the UFS weather model. And um, I was asked to give a short presentation here about um, differences between the release and the develop branches. And it's kind of um, repeating a bit what Mike said beforehand. Um, but anyways, and we'll come back to this picture with the, with the tent later on. So let's have a, a quick look. I cloned the UFS short range weather app version 1.0.1 a few days ago. And then I cloned the app, the develop version at the same day that was 0913, so September 13. And then I just opened the graphical diff view. And as you can see, there is a ton of differences. So you only see the, the top part of this, of this little, you see this little section up here. Um, everything that's blue has changed. Everything that's green is either new or has been removed. The reason why everything sh shows up in green is because some directories have been renamed. And that's why that the diff viewer thinks it's, it's a different it's different. But in any case, even if you compare those directories directly, you'll see that there's a ton of differences. So bottom line is um, a whole bunch of changes have gone into the authoritative repository that have not found their way into, into the version 1.0.1 bug fix release. So there is a huge number of differences. And particularly, um, as I just mentioned, <clears throat> a couple of some of those repositories, the submodules or externals, or whatever you want to name them, have been renamed. So EMC post became UPP, and UFS weather model with underscores became UFS weather model with dashes, just to be consistent with the naming of that repository and so on. But as you can see, so I, I sort of collapsed these together so you don't see any diffs here. You can see that for even among these these files, just in the in the top level in the app repository, most of them have changes. So certainly there are big differences. One of the most important differences when it comes to 
building the code and running it is that um, many of the prerequisites, the third party libraries that are used by the app have changed. And here is a comparison on two slides of all the libraries that are used or um, that have been used. And um, if when they're grayed out, then it's the same version. When they are in, in, in black color, then in full colors, then um, they have changed. So left the release on the right side, you have develop. So you see CMake has been updated. The minimum version is now 3.18. Jasper has been updated. PIO was not required. PIO, parallel IO is now required by the UFS weather model. ESMF has been updated from 800 to 811. FMS is now a library as well. Previously, that was included in the UFS weather model code base, but it has been taken out and converted into a library. Um, then some, several of those NSEP libs, G2 and G2 TMPL, have been updated. On the next slide, IP2 is phased out. It's no longer required. And suppose DCECA26, that cryptic um, repository, is now replaced with the tag UPP 10.0.8. And the buffer library apparently is no longer required either. The rest stays the same. So the question is, you've got, you cloned the, the um, version 1.0.1 of the short range weather app you built the libraries using NZBLIPS external and NZBLIPS as Kyle described the other day. Um, so how, and then you've got all the stuff that's on the left side, on the left column, in the left column of, these, of this table. So how do you get the stuff on the right side, which you need, otherwise you cannot build. So it's super simple on pre-configured platforms, the level one platforms, because all these dependencies are installed anyway, otherwise the UFS weather model uh, would not have been able to run when, with, with that specific hash, for example. And the, the app gets tested there anyway, the developed version. So that's super easy. You can just uh, source those build env and uh, workflow end files as you've done for the for the version one um, public release, and you'll be just fine. It's just the contents is different. It's not so simple on the configurable and limited test platforms that will be referred to as uh, level two and level three. Uh, one reason is that NSIP external and NSIP these two repositories are somewhat deprecated and can't be used. You, you would be able to make these efforts and you know weave those, those up yourself if you wanted to and then get this installed, but it's definitely not straightforward. So the, the two options that you have is install the missing and new dependencies manually, and Kyle alluded to this yesterday, that you could go to each of those repositories, configure the CMake build, and do it um, one after the other. But you need to know the dependencies, and you need to do this many, many times. And so the other option is, is to use HPC stack. And um, Kyle also mentioned this yesterday briefly, but I wanted to give you a little more background on it here. So <clears throat> that's the URL. And in theory, it's pretty simple. You um, basically clone that repository, and then you configure your system, and then you say, say, okay, build my stack, and then you come back after a long break, and everything should be built and ready for you to use. And I will show you the commands in, in a minute. Um, a word of warning, though, you may, stuck, you may get stuck along the road because this is not a public release. It's not supported to the community as, as the, the public release of short range weather and as the NSIP Leipzig external. So there is certainly um, a requirement to make more efforts on your own before you go and ask questions and you can't expect that everything works as smooth. So hopefully it's not going to be as bad as on this picture. This is back in the days when I was uh, installing automated weather stations and eddy flux covariance towers in West Africa. So we got stuck in the Nazinga National Forest in Burkina Faso and it took, it literally took an entire village and the goat and many, many hours to dig this um, Nissan out of, the, out of the mud there. So hopefully it will be a bit smoother for you. So how do you use HPC stack? So as, as Kyle said yesterday, um, HPC stack pen can be used with module environments, which allows you to install multiple versions of libraries in a tree, a hierarchical tree. And this, the requirement for, the, for, for this is that your system has to support Lua modules. So um, for those of you familiar with this, there are two types of modules. There are the old TCLTK modules, and then there are the newer Lua modules. Um, most systems except old craze support Lua, um, if you're an old Cray, it's a little more difficult, but we have solved this problem on Gaia. So if you need help there, let us know. 
Um, if you don't have modules, which is often the case on desktop systems, you can install everything in a flat hierarchy, which means you can only have one version per library because there is no versioning underneath. And if you need a newer version of the stack because you need to replace one library, but you want to keep the old one version working, you just install everything again in a separate directory, which is as simple as once you know the deal. So how does this work? So HPC stack has a um, bunch of configuration examples in config. In the config directory, they all start with config and then underscore mac.sh, config underscore hera.sh, whatever it is. Um, and there's also the stack example, so the collection of, of um, libraries that you want to install that are in, in the stack directory. These are YAML files. And I'll quickly show, show you um, what these are. So the important thing is every time you check out the short range writer app, you gotta make sure that uh, you're building the right requirements. So you will have to adjust this YAML file and, and tweak, a few num um, th tweak a few numbers in there to get the right versions. And then maybe disable or delete stuff you don't wanna build because you don't need it for the app. So if you didn't use that module environments um, because you're on, a, on an HPC system, then you have to run setup module start as H next. And afterwards, you run build stack.sh. If you don't use the modules, you just run build stack, and then you kick off the whole process. So again, the reminder, this is not a tool supported to the community. And everything I'm showing you here may work or may not work. So what I have done, I've put this all together um, in, in a little editor window so you can look at it. Let me pull this over. Jeff, can you see this? Yes, looks good. OK, so this is how I built the current stack just a few minutes ago um, on my Mac. Um, I opened a new shell, and then um, I um, set a few environment variables, um, like where I want to start is where, which kind of LD libraries I need in order to get my compilers right, which compilers I want to use. And then everything, all I had to do was git clone, minus b develop, minus recursive. Uh, going to come back to this and then the location and then where I want to clone it. Then I edited the config, config Mac, adjusted a few things in there. And I can actually open this one. That's very easy. So I'll pull this over here. Um, so basically all it has, all it says, um, you need to set the compiler version something it's it's not really important if you're using if you don't use modules but anyway you need to just adjust those numbers which mpg you want to use which python you want to use and then a bunch of things um, that you can set there straightforward most of them you can just leave as they are and if you're using um, gnu 10 or newer then you need to um, set these this or uncomment these were commented out before and these flags that you know that's compatibility flags so that the code builds so that's basically what i did and then you need to edit that, that stack file. And again, the stack file is um, really easy. Let me just open one quickly. So this thing looks like it contains a bunch of lines where it says, OK, build a new compiler. No, because I already have it. Build MPI, yes. Which flavor, MPI, you could choose open MPI, and which version you want to build, and so on and so forth. And there's the whole, you know, whatever. There's a lot of stuff in the end that you don't need. You can just delete that. Um, so as I said, if you don't use modules, then you don't need to run this command. But if you do use the modules, you would have to run setup modules minus p, which is the install prefix, minus the config you want to use. And then it asks you a bunch of questions, and um, you just answer those. And then you run build stack. Again, you have the prefix, then you have the config, and you provide the stack file. And then off you go. And usually that goes through pretty smoothly. OK. So that's um, on the bill of the HPC stack. Is there any question about this before we move on? Hearing none. OK, so how do you use it then with the short range weather app? <clears throat> um, before I'm, I'm going to give you those details, um, just remember that there is documentation, the UFS short range weather app read the docs, which you have learned about for the public release. There's also a latest version of it. So when you go there, you can choose between the different versions from a pull down menu. And that latest documentation is not up to date with the code in the de developmental branches. So not everything you find there will work in the same way. A lot of it is still as it was for the public release and hasn't been updated. So you have to take this with a grain of salt. But anyway, how do you use that HPC stack with the app? 
So as I said, you need to install the correct version of the libraries. And the easiest way to find out which versions you need is by just looking into env build Hera Intel env, and then the workflow Hera, int, Hera env, and that will tell you exactly which versions you need. Then you set the necessary environment, environment variables to build, and I showed this to you, and then you build the executables after you build the stack, um, just like you would do it for, for the public release. Um, if you want to do this on generic Mac OS and Linux, this required some changes that were recently merged to the regional workflow. And um, I think the only thing that remains to be done is update that hash in the externals config so that the develop branch of the short range web app also sees those changes. <clears throat> and then you need to create that regional workflow config, config.sh file um, following the examples in, in regional workflow slash ash as you just like you did it for. Um, for version one. Just a, a word of caution here, if you just copy over the config.sh from the public release, you will need to do some updates, have some updates, and you can just compare it with one of the existing um, files in the directory that um, like the config community.sh to, to see what has changed. And then you can run Rokodo and the standalone wrappers just in the same way as you, do, as you would do it for the public release. So um, on a system that uses Lua modules, what you would do is um, you would do the usual purge and load modules that that you that the HPC system requires, and then you would do a module use path to HPC stack slash module file st slash stack. The first one is module load HPC and then the version of the stack, and then you load the HPC Intel compiler and all this sits underneath this modules environment here. Um, and then you load the MPI, and then you load all these libraries. Um, and all this is like in the existing env build Hera Intel env. You can just do, you know, exactly the same for the for the system that you're working on. And then you can just build the app and and run it. So that that's pretty straightforward. Um, if you do that on a on a generic Linux or Mac OS system with GNU, and you don't use modules, then you do basically what I just did before, and you export the compiler variables. You say export HPC stack there is equal path to blah, blah, blah. The reason why I'm doing this here is because I have to repeat this um, thing three or four times. I have to set the path to find the bin directory. You have to set the LD library path to find the libraries. On some systems like CentOS, you would have to have lib64 there as well, in addition to lib. You have to set netcdf so that it finds the netcdf variable, and you have to set the ESMF MK file so that the that file is found. That's basically the con configuration file that tells the system how ESMF was built and what you need to do in order to, order to load the libraries. So a few notes on um, what I came across when I tested this recently. One is you need more memory than when you're, when you're using the latest development code than when you're using the public release. And that is especially true for Changes Cube. So if you, if you looked at the the release notes um, that we had the configuration running on Amazon Web Services that was using a 32 gigabyte node, and uh, for the 25 kilometer runs, and that this this node was able to run the to run Changes Cube um, without any additional memory or swap required, but it did no longer work with the latest version. So you need definitely need a few more gigabyte of memory. <clears throat> um, Mike told me that other parts of the processing chain have um, have seen a reduction in memory. So all in all, it's 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 a you know it's a give and take. But you know you just have to account for what the maximum memory is that you need. Um, I also found that there was an issue with running the inline post with the UFS weather model when it was compiled with the debug flags on. So that's when when you do that, you usually check for floating point exceptions and stuff like that. And um, that. That just led to a crash. So if I turned off the debug flags, the code would run through, but it doesn't mean that there's no problem. It just doesn't check whether there are floating point exceptions and it might just produce some NANs or whatever invalid invalid values for certain variables. So that's something that needs to be checked. And I have not tested the met verification capabilities with generic Mac OS and Linux. The only thing I did is run the app to the end, run post, and then look look at those files, but I didn't run any any verification. So why do you have to go through all this overhead and bother about the development branches at all? Coming back to what Mike said before, and the public release code is frozen and it ages off very quickly. And unlike Wine, it doesn't get any better over time. So you may want to work with newer code if you're doing development and testing, just 
to get the latest and greatest. Um, the other thing is also that in order to um, commit any code back to the repositories, you need to work off the latest developmental branches. Otherwise, you can't merge the code for obvious reasons. So you have three different options here. Option number one is you make and test your code changes in the release code. Then you create your branch. And then you pull in all the updates from develop and test with the latest code base. This can be a nightmare because of such a big difference. And sometimes commits are made before the release that never went back to develop. So there might be um, merge conflicts on the horizon. The option number two is you make and test code changes in the release code, but then create your branch and test directly in the latest code base. That's better, but still you might have a lot of confusion because when you make when you make your code changes in the release code, that code might look quite differently from, from later on. So the best option is really to use the release code to get started with the system, get accustomed to how to run the app, how to use it, what it consists of, and then switch directly to the latest code base for development and testing. So that would be my recommended approach. And um, this was the first talk that I want that I'm giving today on the on the differences between the release and the develop branch. The next one will be on the application development. So going through a um, a, a a code change and basically repeating all the steps that that Mike um, mentioned beforehand, so that this is not so such an abstract thing. So I think I'll stop here and ask for questions. Thanks, Dom. Uh, we have about nine minutes for questions. There was one that came in from June on Slack asking if the UFS team has a plan to release a tool like HPC Stack to the community. Since Dom mentioned that HPC Stack is not a tool for the community and NCEP Libs is and will be depreciated, if I understood correctly, Develop Branch needs libraries from HPC Stack for now, and it means that the libraries from NCEP libs specified in V101 are not enough for the develop branch. Am I correct? That's a long question. So I think the answer <laughs> is, is at least as long, or no, it can be actually quite short. The, the, the answer is, I don't know. The, and the reason is that, as, as June knows, but it's good that we explain this here, um, recently the EPIC, um, so the Earth Prediction and Innovation Center has been stood up and um, Raytheon Intelligence, that company that won that contract, is just starting um, their work. So what that means, Epic will be taking over a large part of that public facing um, work. So they will be responsible for future releases, or at least you know, together with us. That's still not clear exactly who is doing what. So, but it is kind of expected that they will be taking responsibility and care of um, releasing the code and then also the prerequisites. So we can tell we can tell these people you have to use HPC stack or you have to use the NSAB libs or you have to come up with something different. So I think it's up to them to decide how they want to go forward. Internally, I know that in, on the NOAA side, we are thinking about moving away from that HPC stack, which is as Kyle said, this, this poor man's um, shell script put together and go to something that uses SPAC, um, which is um, more standard, more community-oriented tool. But I, that, that hasn't happened either yet. So yeah, it's all up in the air. And unfortunately, at the moment, if you want to run any of the latest development codes, you need to, be, you need to either build all the stuff yourself or you need to use HPC stack. Yeah, that, the move from HPC stack to SPAC is complicated by Epic coming online. So it remains to be seen how that's going to evolve in the future. But uh, we will see. Um, thanks, June, for that question. Uh, Geely, I see you have your hand up. Uh, go ahead. Um, so uh, the runtime has to be used exactly the same modules as used in the building process, or only part of them are needed for the runtime? Well, most of these libraries are, I'm unmuted, yes, I am. Um, most of these libraries are static, so they get compiled into the executable. Um, and then you don't have any problem. But some of them are dynamic libraries. So you better make sure that you use exactly the same environment when you build than when you run. Because if you link against other dynamic libraries, you can get all sorts of problems. Thanks. Yeah, Geely, we, we handle that mostly under the hood in the workflow um, where the same modules get loaded for build and for runtime. So 
generally speaking, that's transparent to the user if they're running the end-to-end -end system. Yeah, so uh, just to say, sometimes if we would like to use, uh, just change the code or use a different version of the code, say for UFS weather model, the public guests need to be more consistent, like have to change both of the building and the runtime modules, right? Yeah, if, if you make changes, if you update whatever version you're running um, and that uh, when you run the workflow, then yes, there could be differences that, that need to be made for both build and runtime. And so you need to modify the, uh, the environment um, file that handles all the, um, the loads of the modules. But um, it, when we load the same file for the build and runtime in the workflow, so we're trying to keep things consistent there. Uh, but yeah, if you update, you know, one of your uh, externals, uh, if you update your UFS weather model, then yeah, you would have to make updates to that environment file as well. Okay, any other questions for Dom? If not, uh, we do have a 15 minute break scheduled um, at 10.30 to reconvene for Dom's second talk at 1045. So if there are no other questions, we can go ahead and break and, and reconvene 1045 uh, Mountain. Oh, there is a question from Rob. Let's see. Could you please expand upon the level of support for HPC stack in the future? Well, that's <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll let Dom handle that. Yeah, that's, that's difficult to say because it really depends on what Epic is going to do. If HPC stack is going to be only used internally by NOAA, then we will be able to provide some level of support, but it's not going to be the same as for the public release where we have, you know, commitments, I mean, financial commitments, programmatic commitments to support that. Um, if, if NOAA is also moving away from it and going to something that is uh, spec built, then that support will of course phase out. But right now it's the only the only convenient option that we have. So you can expect that if you, and we've seen this in the past, if people create issues or ask questions um, in, in GitHub on the HPC stack page, then that those get addressed and answered pretty quickly. Thanks, Dom. That's one more. All right. Um, any last final questions? Okay, if not, uh, we'll go ahead and break and we will reconvene in 17 minutes. See y'all then. We'll go ahead and get started again. Thanks all, hope you enjoyed a couple minutes to stretch your legs and uh, move around a little bit. Um, so at this point, Dom is going to be doing a little bit of a demo, um, sharing his screen and, and showing us around. Um, so Tom, at this, do you, would you prefer if people have questions, should they kind of just chime in as you're going or how, how would you like to handle questions during this portion? Anything's fine. If you want to interrupt and ask questions, that's fine. I closed my Slack and email, so I will not get any notifications on those. So if someone sends a question in Slack, then you'd have to monitor that and interrupt me, please. Okay, no problem. Okay. Yeah, it's important to ask questions as we go because uh, this can be very confusing. Okay, so welcome back everyone. We start this off with one or two slides. Um, this is about how to develop in the UFS application building on what Mike said. So I'm really thankful for his talk because that laid, that was all the groundwork for um, what I'm going to do now. Um, so here is the tent again. So the question, why the tent? Well, I love going outdoors and camping and spending my time there. So I wanna do work as efficiently as possible. And as you will see, or maybe have seen already with GitHub, especially you can do the same thing in 10 different ways. And every developer has his or her own preferred approach. I think the one that I've come down to is uh, one of the efficient ones, but it's certainly up to you um, to do it in whatever way that works for you. But if you get confused along the way when I'm presenting it, please stop and ask. All right, so the scenario we're going through is a change in roughness length. So a change in roughness length for grassland for the grassland category in NOAA MP leads to more accurate forecasts in this idea. 
So NOAA MP has got a bunch of tables that are in the in the CCPP physics code base are sort of hard coded in Fortran files for performance. And so you don't have to read in these files from tables when you start up the model. And um, so the change that we want to make requires going into this file physics NOAA MP tables and then replace this value 0 0.12 with 0 0.20. And that's all there is. And it would be very easy if everything was just one repository and it's fine. But as you've seen beforehand, life is a bit more difficult, unfortunately. So <clears throat> the UFS short range weather app has four externals that are configured, one of them being the UFS weather model, which itself then has a ton of um, submodules. And because we are making a change in one of those repositories underneath the UFS weather model, we will be, we will be required to make changes in the whole number in, in at least four um, repositories and you will see why. So here's the UFS weather model <clears throat> underneath FV3. Then there is CCPP physics, which itself has submodules as well, but we are not touching those. We're making a tiny little change in CCPP physics. As Mike said before, and all these repositories are glued and held together by recording information on which kind of commit or hash or tag you want to say. Um, it's pointing to for those submodules. So if I'm making a change in CCPP physics and I'm changing this one parameter from 0 0.12 to 0 0.20, that means I'm committing something, I'm creating a new hash. <clears throat> then I need to tell FE3 that it has to point to this new hash. Then of course the FE3 hash gets updated. So I need to go up and tell the UFS weather model that I need to point to a new hash of FE3. And then of course I need to go up, <clears throat> excuse me, to the UFS short range weather app and in the externals.config tell it to point to a new hash of the UFS weather model. So a single change of only three digits, or two digits better to say, requires creating four cascading pull requests. And that's, that is the process that I'm trying to lay out here. So the process here is, first we have to create an issue because every work should be preceded by an issue that says what we are doing and why. Then we need to create forks for each of those repositories that we make changes in. In this case, it's four repositories. You only do this the first time and Mike showed you this process. So I'm going to skip because I have done this in the past anyway. And then you check out the repository and my approach is slightly different. I always check out the authoritative repository and configure my remotes accordingly. Um, then I make the code changes, create my branches, set the submodule pointers, create pull requests, run some preliminary tests, and then you can add and suggest reviewers um, so that your pull request gets reviewed. Um, when it's time to commit, you know, as we said before, and for the year for the weather model, there is a commit queue. So it takes a while until your pull requests bubble up to the top. Then you have to pull in the latest changes from the authoritative repositories. And at this point, you can run the regression tests for the components and also the end-to-end -end test for the application. And then you need to wait for the approval from the reviewers, and then you have to merge the code from bottom to top each time updating that submodule pointers. So keep that in mind. I'm going to exit that slideshow and um, <clears throat> maybe we can try to leave this open band in the, in the back there. So let's go. Uh, is that font big enough, Jamie? Can you see that properly? Uh, maybe a click or two bigger, if possible. That's great, yeah. thank you. Okay. On my screen, this is for people with eye cancer now, but it's, it's fine, I'll, <laughs> I'll manage. Okay, so basically what I did is I um, ran the following command. I ran git clone minus b develop minus minus recursive, and then the URL, and then I called this subdirectory UFS app develop for tutorial. Uh, that's a, just a convenient a thing that I'm always doing. I'm always specifying the branch. I'm always saying recursive. <clears throat> because you never know if someone in the meanwhile has added some submodules underneath. And that's just a habit. Always doing it means you, you can't forget it. And then I went inside and I ran this checkout externals command and then and made a few changes. So this here is already a git status in that, in that repository. So I modified this file already, externals config, and I will show you later. And then of course I got all these externals checked out. So let's go to source. UFS weather model, FE3 CCPP physics. This is the repository in which we are going to make this change. And I already made this change. So git diff says in physics, no MP tables, this one line has been changed. So this value here has been replaced with this value. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, to configure the remotes. Git remote minus v show. 
Right now, it just says origin points to NCAR. And that's because I checked out the authoritative repository from the beginning. And so everything is pointing to the authoritative repositories. A word on these repositories, on these remotes, there is nothing special about something being called origin or upstream. You can call them whatever, and none of them has a special meaning except that one of them is the authoritative repository where you generally cannot push to. So in this, what I always do is um, because I get confused with what is upstream origin, I just rename them to something reasonable. So I would say git rename origin and car. <clears throat> yeah, remote rename. Okay, now this is ncar. Then I can add my own one, git, add, git, remote, add, dom. And then I take this entire URL and just replace ncar with my username. So if you always wondered who is Clem Pudi, that's me. <clears throat> okay, now I've got these two remotes. Of course, I have to do this in every repository in, in which I need to make changes. So I need to do this in, I did it in, in physics, CCPP physics, I have to do it in FE3. I'll have to do it in UFS weather model. And I'll also have to do it in the app. <clears throat> I'm a lazy person. So I wrote a little Python script that does that for me. That basically goes to all these repositories and just um, configures the authoritative repository and configures my, my fork of it. <clears throat> so that's running right now. And it's only doing it for the ones that we need. So here for FE3 ATM, it's re renaming the origin to NOAA EMC and then adding my climb Fuji. For the UFS weather model, it's doing the same. And CCPP physics, it recognizes that I did that manually already. So that's done. So now I don't have to worry about this anymore. And uh, remember, so I have the remotes configured DOM and NCAR. OK, so now I can commit my changes. But before that, let's go back and do the most important thing, which I forgot, shame on me, namely creating the issue, because we said that every piece of work has to be preceded by an issue. So let's get a new browser window. Put that here. GitHub.com, NCAR, CCPP physics. Let's go to issues. Okay, new issue. Sometimes there are templates. In this case, there are a choice between bug reports and feature requests. It's a feature request, not really a bug. So I, fortunately, I prepared this before and so I don't have to type, type in everything, everything. So title, ignore for blah, 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 update reference length for grassland category, and then the description. And I'm just going to ignore that there is, that there is this whole thing. I just say description and put this code there. Okay, submit new issue. Okay, we have created a new issue and you're welcome to read this by yourself. I wrote this after a few beers in the evening. So anyways, we, we created the issue. I can move this aside. Now, let's start the work. I already made the change as I showed, showed you. <clears throat> so now it's time to commit to create a new branch and commit my chains. So git checkout minus b update roughness length grass length no mp. And now I do a git add, and I can just do dot because that will add everything that has changed underneath, but it's only one file. And then I do my git commit, which says increase roughness length for grassland category n. I'd always recommend to use meaningful commit messages and not <laughs> git commit, and not you know just um, update or bug fix because that's just not helpful at all. No one, no one knows what, what this means, right? Now I did this, okay. I'm ready to push this up to the to GitHub. So now I do a git push, and let's just take my branch name here. And I git push DOM, of course. So I push it to my fork. And as Mike said beforehand, for convenience, you get this URL. So I can just go there, type it in here. And again, I prepared all this beforehand, so I can just copy my title. And then just saying this PR increases the roughness length for category <clears throat> um, for grassland category in no MP C, and then I can take the URL of the issue C. And then what you would like to do is usually you do like fixes something, and you create a pull request, and 
for the first time ever, you've created your pull request and that's going to end car main. I don't have to do anything because the default target is set correctly. So what happens if this PR gets merged, then uh, it will automatically close this, this issue. Okay, that was easy, right? So now comes all this overhead. I'm going up to FE3. If I do a get status here, then you see that CCPV physics has changed because there's new commits have been made. And this commit lives, doesn't live in the authoritative repository, it lives in my fork and my branch. So what you have to do is you have to make a change in Git modules to tell Git modules where to find this commit. And this is very important to do that. Um, first of all, it helps reviewers to find the code. Second, it allows reviewers and also the automatic regression testing systems to check out the code recursively and check out the right hash from the right branch. So what does it mean? Basically what I've done is I've commented out the default URL for, for CCPP physics, which is NCAR branch main. And I've just pointed it temporarily to mine, the client Fuji and the branch. And then of course I have this, this sub-module pointer update at CCPP physics. So I just took it at dot, And I can do git checkout minus b. I call this branch the same. So remember, if I do git add, it doesn't commit it yet. So now I do a git commit. And usually what I call this, because it's always the same, update.git modules and submodule pointer for code review and testing. And then I can push all this to my fork. And because I ran my little Python script that configures the road, remotes correctly, um, this just pushes it to mine. So I can go to here, open the next browser window. I can put the title in there. <clears throat> Ignore for short range weather tutorial only, update roughness lens, and so on and so on. Oh, okay. And now you're seeing something bad here. You are seeing that there is a red cross that says you can't automatically merge. And you know why? Because we are not up to date with the current development branches, but we're going to fix that later. We can create the pull request anyway, as this thing says. <clears throat> so create pull request. And usually what we, what we should have in these pull requests, and let me just add this here, usually what we require as the code managers is to have a list of associated PRs and um, usually also the UFS weather model PR or the, the, the PR that summarizes all the testing. Right now, this is still missing. So I just put missing there. Okay, so we've done this. Now we have to go up and do the same for the UFS weather model, its status, because of course the FE3 ATM submodule pointer has changed. So, and again, I already made the change. I changed NOAA EMC develop to my own branch. So again, I can do git checkout minus b. And then I can do git add dot. And then I can do the git commit message, which reads the same update submodule pointer for FE3 ATM for code review and testing. <clears throat> and then I can do a git push. Um, and of course, I forgot the name of the remote. And again, I get a URL. So this is the UFS weather model now. So notice this is my third PR that I've created just for changing one number in a, in a single file. Okay, I put the title in there. And as you notice here is a template and usually I'd be required to fill this template. And so what I've done is I have sort of copied the template into my text browser and I have um, filled it sort of offline already. And then I can create the pull request. And again, it says I cannot automatically merge because something is not right. I'm behind. So this is not true. It's not up to date. It hasn't been tested yet. Um, the issue has been created. Here's the requirement for having an issue. And there's no new input data required. And I, I mentioned this here. It says no new input data, no changes to the to regression tests other than NOAA MP. Okay, that's good. So now I've got everything that I need for the UFS weather model because I have all the associated PRs that go together. I have the URL of this one here, which is the CCPP physics. Does anyone know how to get rid of this 
this annoying window there. Anyway, um, so usually what it requires you to put those dependent PRs in here. So I'll take the one from the, I cannot get rid of this, this thing. Oh yes, let's move it somewhere else. Dom, just so you know, we, we can't actually see it. So it, it's you not can, ruining but, at our, our end. But it's ruining me because I cannot see what I'm clicking on or what I have to copy. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Um, I, I moved mine to my other screen. I don't know if you have that. I can, well, this is fine right now. It's okay. Thank you. All right, so I listed those, those PR here as dependencies. And I also wanted to mention the issue because that's part of the requirements that we say what the issue is. So it fixes the issue here. And then there is notes on testing, of course, and we come back to this in a minute. Okay, so we've got those. There's only one missing. We only need the app. So let's go up to the to the app to the app level. If I do a git diff, um, it's well, git status of course doesn't show me any changes for the weather weather model because this is checked out with managed external. So git GitHub cannot deal with this kind of stuff. But I know that something has changed. And so in 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 that externals files, I think I already made this change where I said instead of pointing to a hash in the authoritative repository here, that hash, I'm saying, okay, just point to my my fork and point to this branch. So can so I will always point to the top of this branch for now. So now everything is ready. I just have to get add externals.config. And just to remind you, here I haven't configured the remotes because this is not part of my scripts usually. So I can say git remote rename origin, and then I just say UFS community. It doesn't really matter what you call it. And git remote add DOM. Okay. Okay, so we've got this. So now I can do the same again. I can do git checkout minus B. Did I already do a git add? Yes, I did. So I only have to do the git commit. In this case, I just call it update external.config for code review and testing. And then I can do git push DOM, that name of the branch. So now I have a fourth PR that's now for the app. And again, I'm copying in my pre-configured title. And I also use this template and prepare this on my, on my local machine. We can look at it quickly. So description of changes, tests conducted, dependencies. So I would have to put this dependency from the UFS weather model in here. There is no documentation updates required because it's only changing one number. The issue I can put in here. And you see, it's a lot of copy and paste, but if you do that somewhat efficiently, then you can save yourself some time. Okay, now we've got this. Now we've got all the PRs. So now everyone, including all reviewers, can go check out the code recursively using the same steps, except that the very first, the top level checkout is not the authoritative repository, but my fork in my branch. And then they get exactly the same code that I used for testing or for my development. So where are we in the process? We have created the issue, we have the forks, we checked out the repositories, configured the remotes, we made the code changes, we created the branches, we set the submodule pointers, we create the PRs. And now would be to, time to run some preliminary tests. I'm not going to run any tests right now um, because that will just take too long. But let's say I just take my code and I run the, the tests with the short range weather app. And you can run the same test that you have run as part of the public release, or you can run the end to end workflow tests, which I'm going to show you later. And then, of course, it's time to um, get these code changes reviewed or add reviewers so that people know that they have to look at it. So uh, you might have noticed when I created the CCPP physics PR that several people were added automatically and they have this little shield thing here. This is because these people have been identified as code owners for this repository. So they get added to every 
pull request that gets opened. And at least, and the way this is configured for this repository, at least one code owner has to approve the pull request before it can be merged. If not, then you cannot merge the PR. I could add other people here. And I think because, um, I don't know if, if Mike Kabulic is here and this list, no, we don't have him. Do we have Jeff back or not? Well, let's add Jun Wang for the moment. <clears throat> um, so I can add Jun as a reviewer here. You probably don't have right permissions to do that. So you, I could ask you, hey, uh, who do you think should review this code? And you can tell me, oh yeah, uh, let's add Jun. So I add Jun. So what happens? Jun gets an email and probably she is now confused unless she's listening to the presentation where she gets to review the stuff. But that tells her, okay, please look at this pull request and provide your, your feedback. And um, you will do that for every PR. So in FV3 ATM, there are no reviewers at the moment. And I could add someone here, but I'm just skipping it now. It usually suggests something, but this doesn't make any sense right now. I could add John and Dushan, for example. Um, and then same for the weather model. I could add reviewers manually, or you would ask the, the developers or the code managers if you don't have access. And then here you see that the same that worked for CCPP physics also works for the short range weather app. There are the code owners, so Gerard, Jeff, Julie, and Mike already have to notify about these changes. So they should all be able to review this now. Okay, well, after some time and some code review and some updates and back and forth, and remember if someone asks you to update something in CCPP physics in your actual PR, you will have to propagate these submodule pointer updates all the way up to the app all the time, every time you make a change. Um, but let's say at some point this is all okay, and then your, your PR is at the top of the list and it's time to, um, to merge. So the first thing you have to do is you have to update it um, with the code in the latest repositories and the authoritative repositories. And there are different ways to do that. And I think the easiest and least confusing way with all the submodules is that again, you start at the very bottom, the, the, the sort of the the lowest submodule that you have. So you go to source UFS weather model, FE3, CCP physics. Remember, git log, you started from wherever the hash was, and then you made this one pull request here. And this, this branch is definitely behind um, the authoritative repository. So what you would do is remember git remote minus v show. I configured DOM and I configured NCAR. I'm going to do a git remote update just to make sure I get any new changes. Um, my Python script that I showed in the beginning does all these remote updates anyway. And since in this last five minutes, nothing has been committed, you don't see those. Um, but what I can do now, I can do git pull ncar main. And hopefully this goes through without conflict. So I'm pulling in the main. Yeah, it looks good. And you see there is, I don't know, a ton of changes, right? Many, many, many files. So that just tells you that the short range weather app um, it's currently pointing to a hash of the UFS weather model that's pretty far behind, like a, a few weeks or something like that, which in UFS weather model commit cycles is ages, eternity. So anyway, I did that. Now I have to push this up to, to GitHub. So again, if you don't remember the name of the branch, you can do git status. Oh, and you see something. You see that something has changed in physics, RTE, RRTMGP. You didn't make any changes there. Um, that just means that one of those commits that you just pulled and updated the submodule pointer to RITMGP. So you have to pull this update in as well. And how do you do that? Well, you do git submodule update and you can do it with minus minus recursive in case RTE, RITMGP had submodules and then this directory. Okay, we're lucky because it found this. It found this automatically, sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't, you have to go to physics RTE, RITMGP, run git remote update, go back out and then do that git submodule update. But if I do this now, then I have a clean plate, <clears throat> nothing to go bad, everything is fine. And then I can do git push. Ah, of course. I don't know how many times I get this wrong today. <clears throat> so now I've updated CCPV physics. Okay, let's go up to our FE3 PR. That's the next in the list. Okay, of course we have already a new commit CCPP physics because we just changed something. So again, I do git remote update. Then I do git pull NOAA EMC. 
If you're not sure about which, what the name of the authoritative repository is, you can go to the parent, host mo the parent model, so the UFS weather model in this case, and look into the .git modules file. And then you see what the default branch name is. Okay, ah, now we got a conflict, of course. We got a conflict because we advanced the CCPP physics submodule pointer to something else than what the previous pull requests in FE3 did because they didn't have our commit. But in this case, it's super easy. It's already telling you if this is correct, then just you know stop thinking, copy and paste this line, and you're fine. So if I do that, then that CCPP physics is gone. But there is a problem apparently both modified. That's a conflict in .git modules. So what's wrong in .git modules? Okay. Oh, so just the recent commit. That that's a good point from Rahul that went in this morning. Changed all these tabs into spaces to be consistent with what's used in the other parts. So I made this change here, and this is what Rahul changed. So in this case, it's super easy. I just take my my two lines and make them consistent with the spaces and remove all this other stuff. And then I solve the conflict. So now that I've solved it, I can just say git add dot git modules. You can do git add dot git modules if you, even if you don't do anything, but then you have these merge conflicts markers, these you know angle brackets and, uh, and the equal signs and everything in there. And of course it will break stuff. So you gotta be careful when you do get add, you need to be sure that you really resolve all the conflicts in the files. Okay, again, we have the same problem that there are apparently new commits in, in the die core and in the framework that we haven't made. So we need to pull these in the app submodule point updater. So we need to do git submodule update this and that. Okay. So now it looks good. I can just say git commit. Okay, and then I can push it up. <laughs> Mike, please remind me to put this dome there. I'm <laughs> just, okay, good, that's fine. So we do the same in the UFS weather model. Get remote update. Get pull NOAA EMC develop. And I get another submodule pointer FV3 conflict, which is for the same reason as before, and because I made changes there and they made changes there. So let's have a look at git status. Okay, wow, see that there's a ton of submodules. All of them had new had um had new commits that we didn't make. So let's do git submodule. Sorry, up module update. And here I'm adding minus minus recursive because I know that some of these have recursive submodules also, submodules themselves. Excuse me. And I couldn't really prepare this before and because I didn't really know how much stuff would go in until this morning. But you see that there have been, has been a, a lot of development recently. I'm just doing this one by one. I'm not just running it without any argument because I never know what it does with my own submodules. Okay, so that worked fine. And I can do git commit. And then I can push it up. So what did that do? Let's have a look. Beforehand, um, here we are. Beforehand, there was a conflicting file. If I click on reload, then the conflict is gone <clears throat> because I just merged the brand develop in here. Okay, so that's all good. Um, we have updated all the code except the app. So now we have to go back to the app. Oh, okay. This happens when you do a Git remote update when you haven't done it automatically before and with a script, it will just pull all the hashes, uh, all the branches from each remote that is configured and show you, okay, there's a new branch. You can do something with it. So 
none of this is of, of importance, of course. I can just do git pull and I call it UFS community, I'm pretty sure. And what was the name of the main branch again for the for the app develop? Okay, uh, there are no changes. I checked this code a few days ago or yesterday or whatever, a few days ago, it's all fine. Okay, so nothing to do here. And I don't need to update any hash because remember in externals config, I said that I'm not pointing to a specific hash, but I'm pointing just to the head of this branch here. All right, <clears throat> now it's time to run the regression tests. And in most cases, especially if you're an external developer who doesn't have access to the NOAA machines or the testing platforms, um, you will not do this yourself, but the code managers will help you or will, will do that for you. But let's just for the sake of um, completeness um, have a quick look how it works. So because we made changes in the UFS by the model with has, which has its own set of regression tests and then the app which has its own set of end-to-end -end tests, we would be required to run both tests. Um, so the UFS by the model regression test, that's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, so what I've done, I have, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong window here. I bring this one here over. I've logged into Hera. I have a change to my working directory. Um, then I've, what I've done is, and that's the whole point of all this juggling of submodule pointers. I have run this command, git clone minus B, and then the name of the branch, my branch, minus minus recursive, and then <clears throat> and then um, this this URL, and that's of course wrong because the URL needs to be climb Fuji. And then I call this directory. I've called this directory Intel because usually I run with GNU and with Intel on on Hera the regression tests. So I put this in a subdirectory which I've created beforehand, and then I just call this subdirectory here Intel. <clears throat> okay, something is not. What did I do wrong? Did I do anything? I did anything. I did something wrong, I guess. Um, let's try it again. That's the live demonstration effect, right? Oh, I added something that. Yeah, now it works. So this is checking out the entire UFS weather model code with all my branches as configured in, in the pull request. And that takes a while. And um, while this is happening, um, running the regression test is pretty easy and there's a ton of documentation on it. Um, basically what you do, and I'm putting this here, you need to set a compiler, whereas Intel is default. So if you, if you wanna switch to GNU, you just type export RT compiler equal GNU or in this case, I just leave it at Intel. You don't have to set it. You set an account number, <clears throat> which is the computer account you want to use for testing. And then once this checkout is finished, I will have to go to Intel, which is basically the UFS weather model top level directory. And then I go to tests. And then the way to run the full regression test with for the Intel compiler <clears throat> is just dot slash RT dot SH minus E, which means use EC flow. And on Hera, you have to log into a special node to do that. And then it runs all the tests and usually it runs like 10 compile jobs in parallel. And then it runs as many jobs as it can fit in the queue. And it takes about an hour or one and a half to complete all 100 something tests that we have. You can also just specify running one test. Um, that will be this command here. You say, oops, where was I? Sorry, I just clicked the wrong, yeah. You say minus E, <clears throat> and then minus n in the name of the test. And then you would just run one test. And we will actually kick this thing off. It's pretty quick and easy once it's checked out. But you see, it's checking out a whole bunch of code underneath here. So we are already in FE3, CCPP physics. So here it's going and getting my branch. And then it checks out the RTMGP underneath there, which is not my branch, but just the unmodified one. Still take some time. Um, while we wait for this, are there any questions at the moment? There hasn't been anything coming through on Slack or Zoom chat, but if anybody does have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Go ahead. 
Go ahead, Russell. Yeah, Russell. Well, it's, just, it's a hell of a lot of work to change one number. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> but that's the problem. Sure, sure um, point one two wasn't all right. But I mean, but seriously, that's that's a lot doing a lot of work. But surely there's some way of automating the feedback up through the branches rather than having to do it manually. He, we haven't come up with a good way to do that, to be honest. If you know one, then no, that would I don't, be awesome. It just seems like a staggering amount of work. To... Yeah, I mean, realistically, pull requests don't often consist That's of just right. one number. And if we had such a tiny pull request uh, that just changes one number, um, then there would be a night. There would be a chance to combine this with something else, and you know, so combine a few pull requests. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's just the thought of yes, that there's a lot. Seems a lot of administrative overhead to get something done. I yes. And I mean, one of the more agile approaches is, of course, that you can just commit stuff. Um, and then at some point you commit stuff to CCPP physics and then at some point you update the submodule pointer and you check if things are still working. And that's fine. And that works maybe in nine out of 10 times, but at some point something breaks and then you have to go back for commits of an entire week maybe and look at every single one and test which one breaks the, breaks the, pro the system. And that takes so much more time that it's really, that we have come down to this, this very strict approach that we only run every every new change has to come in on the top of the of the authoritative repositories. There can be no overlapping commits without being tested completely, because every time we had to do something like this, go back and figure out what went wrong, it took so much more time than sure. doing it this way. And you can automate a lot of this. I mean, I'm you know I'm showing it to you step by step so that you understand what the system is. But if I do that myself and I do this, I don't know, three or four times a week then I automate things with, um, you know, browser help and, and little Python scripts and whatever else. Yeah, Dom and Russell, this is a really great point that there's a lot of overhead that's involved with GitHub and Git. And I mean, some of it, a lot of it is there for a reason, um, just to make sure that our code commits are sound and that we're, you know, making sure the development is happening as it should and we're not introducing any bugs into the code. Um, I will say that one of the issues here is the submodules. Um, in, in some of the other UFS repositories, we don't have those. So um, PRs are a little bit more straightforward in regional workflow or, or UFS utils. There's still overhead there, um, but um, that's something that innovation is going to need to try and tackle in the future for the community to try and um, streamline uh, the requirements and, and the methods that um, developers uh, use to get code into the repository. So, Hopefully, Epic will tackle that in the near future. We, we will see. And the reality, Russell, is also that if you had created this PR for, for CCPP physics and you were an outside contributor, then it's very likely that I or someone else um, from EMC would have said, OK, we're going to just uh, we have another change in, in FE3, for example, that doesn't change any results. So we will just simply point to your CCPP physics branch when we, when we run this test and we include your change in our pull request. And then when it's time to merge, we merge your code and we deal with the overhead that, that's coming um, with all this stuff. So um, we checked out the code, everything's fine. I changed to the test directory. So you remember Intel is kind of the top level repository of the UFS weather model with all the stuff underneath. And so all I have to do is in order to run this one test, I run dot, dot slash RT dot SH minus E and then minus N is the name of the control. Otherwise it would run everything that is in RT dot conf, which is, yeah, I hear the line breaks, but it's, it's a ton of tests, like 100 something. So if I kick this off, <clears throat> then it starts an EC flow server or finds one that is already running, and then it submits job to the queue. In this case, it's super simple. Um, yeah, I'm watching the my queue. Um, it's one compile job because I'm only running one job afterwards, so I need to only compile the executable one time. And once this, this compile job finishes, then it will go and run the test, and if the results are correct, then it will, will say, yeah, regression test passed. In this case, it would not, of course, because I changed the number. So, oh, in this case, it would, because that's a NOAA test another NOAA MP test. But if I ran a, a, a test that um, was using NOAA MP under the hood, then I would get different results and we would have to create new baselines 
and then verify against these baselines to make sure we still have run to run reproducibility we didn't break re break restart reproducibility we didn't break the we didn't get we don't get different answers if we change the number of mbi tasks or the number of threads and stuff like that so there's a whole battery a whole bunch of testing that's going on there so that's for the hey. ufs weather model Dom, I'm just going to interrupt yeah. real quick. So I saw Mike's hand up briefly. And Mike, I just wanted to make sure you had a chance to chime in if you wanted to. Oh, it can wait till the end. OK, all right, thanks. OK. Yeah, I really only have one more um, thing to mention. So the other thing is the app testing. And um, so the UFS short range whether people have created these workflow end-to-end -end tests. And the way to run these is, um, I just have it here. And I just put this up here for <clears throat> our perusal. So um, you, again, you would just join. We would just you would just clone. In my, in this case, you would clone my branch, which was the uh, that NOAA MP update branch. And you would say maybe minus minus recursive, but it doesn't matter for the app. Um, but in, but then you just run manage manage externals, <clears throat> and then you build your code. Uh, you build the executable just in the same way as if you're running your single or ready student test. Then you go to source the workflow environment. Then you go to the regional workflow test, we to e so workflow end to end. Then you need to create a file that lists the names of the tests that you want to run. <clears throat> and in order to find out what tests there are, you need to look into a sub sub uh, directories of this workflow end to end directory. And then you just take the name of these of these tests. So you create a file. In this case, I created just one one test in that in that file. And then you have this at this time at this point in time, this kind of non-standard command. And I already created an issue to fix this. Um, run workflow end to end test that is age, where you say the test file is machine is here, and this is the account to use. And then you run this. And then this thing goes con runs regional workflow just as you're familiar with from the app. Um, and then it adds this, this um, launch workflow command so that Rokoto launcher to your cron tab. And once the tests pass, it removes this from the cron tab again. And that's all there is for the end to end tests. I'm not sure if people are supposed to run this by themselves or if, um, if the, the app managers are doing this. I think uh, Jamie, Jeff, or Mike, you can speak to that. Yeah, so we would request that the person that is issuing the PR um, to do those tests, if at all possible, um, on select platforms. Now, obviously, they can't run on all of the tier one platforms, for example, so we would farm some of those out. Um, but doing some initial testing, at least on one platform, uh, would, would um, be required. Okay, good. Okay, we are basically out of time, but I wanted to mention one last important thing. So when it's time to merge, you have to go through this entire um, hierarchy again. So what happens is this PR gets, this PR here gets, oh yeah, Julie approved it. Nice, thank you, Julie. This PR gets merged. I'm not going to merge it. I'm going to close it instead. But I would click on merge pull request. That would do that. I'm closing it instead. But basically what happens is if I merge it, the submodule, that NCAR main submodule uh, or branch gets updated. So what I have to do is make sure that that in the in my pull request for FE3 ATM, I'm pointing back to the authoritative repository. FE3 CCP physics. So I do a get remote update. If if I had merged this pull request, then it would say, oh, there was an up update from NCAR, NCAR main. In any case, I'm doing a git checkout ncar slash main. Note that the slightly different notation here with the slashes between the origin and the branch, uh, the, the fork and the branch. Um, this would point to my new hash. Now I'm just pointing back to before I created my branch and read and changed the submodule pointers, but the, the mechanism is the same. Because if I go back to FE3 now, then I see that the CCPP physics submodule pointer has changed, like a new commit. In this case, it's going back to an old commit, but if I had merged the PR, it would be a new commit. So what I have to do is I have to edit Git modules again. I have to remove my temporary changes that I made and uncomment these. I forgot to comment them out. Um, and then I will have to, sorry, 
git add dot and then git commit minus m revert change to dot git modules and update sub module pointer for CCPP physics. Great, many typos and then we'll git push. So what this, what this does is that it updates my FE3 AT MPR to point to the head of the NCAR develop branch again, which is required. Then the next, the next step would be to merge FE3. Then I would go to the UFS weather model, update that, that submodule pointer to point to the correct FE3 in the develop branch again. And then I'll do the same in the end in external config where I point to the new hash of the UFS weather model instead of my temporary fork and branch. I'm not going through this anymore because that's exactly the same process. But that is the important part that you merge from the bottom to top, do everything from the bottom to top, make your changes from the bottom to top, um, including all the submodule pointers, do the update from the authoritative repositories from bottom to top, and then do the merge from bottom to top. And that's all there is for making pull requests and getting changes committed. That's it. That's awesome. Um, Mike, go ahead. Um, yeah, th thanks for the demonstration, Thomas. It was really great. Um, I just wanted to return to the point about overhead. Um, <clears throat> and I feel like it's important to point out the alternative, which is that every single one of these individual repositories with share code are not synchronizing their updates. Um, so if you wanted to make sure that this code made it to every repository that needs it, you need to make the same change in a, maybe a dozen different places in a bunch of different repositories, and you had no automated way of knowing if you missed one. Um, and also, we have to remember that the ultimate benefit of the UFS paradigm, so the benefits that the system has provided, um, because other developers have taken the time to put their changes in the UFS, we know for a fact that they're we're using the same code. Uh, whether you're using a uh, short range weather app, medium range weather app, different applications. Um, and you <clears throat> are benefiting from the fact that many other people are using the exact same code. Uh, you know that, that the bug fixes that go into one application are coming into your application. Um, for example, your, it, you, may, you may not care about this. You know, I'll, I'll just make my own changes and I'll, uh, I'll work on the side and never update my fork and it'll be fine. Well, you, you don't know that maybe you're seeing these strange results that you don't understand and somebody has solved that problem in some far away repository that you never check. And a year later, you're still trying to solve this problem that's been solved by somebody else already. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that we explicitly stated like all of this overhead may seem like a bit of a slog and it can be. Um, but as Dom said, as you get more experience, it will become quicker. And there are huge benefits that come along from working uh, in the UFS framework um, and taking advantage of the changes that have come from all other places. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's absolutely true. All right, are there any questions for Dom at this point? Any other questions? Okay, thanks again, Dom. Really appreciate your overview there. A um, lot of really important information for people to know and begin to learn. Um, I'm sure that it's, it's a little confusing the first time you see it for sure, but um, hopefully as you use it more often, it becomes a little more familiar. So we're scheduled at this point for a lunch break. Uh, we will reconvene at 1230, so just under an hour from now. Um, and at that point, Lori Carson will be giving us a presentation on CCPP for developers. So we'll come back again uh, with everybody. Um, we're not doing an official hands-on practice uh, session today. Our afternoon session will be open discussion and questions and answer, Q a Q&A session that Michael lead um, a lot of it coming from questions that have come up during the week and anything else that um, you can think of or has, have remaining questions about um, this afternoon. So please do come back if you're able for the rest of the afternoon and um, we'll see you then. Thanks so much.
All right, welcome back everyone. We'll get started here in a, a minute or two. I'll wait for a number of the participants to come back. Hey, Lori. Yeah. Looks like uh, Slack is trying to install an update. <laughs> oh, I know. I get those all the time. <laughs> okay. I will try to actually, maybe I'll uh, go exit out of Slack just a minute here. So don't interrupt. No matter how many times I install it, it comes back. So. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll wait another minute or so. I see we're up to 43 participants. I think we were around 60 earlier today, so. OK. All right, we're, we're two minutes past the bottom, bottom of the hour, so we'll probably go ahead and get started. Um, the next talk will be uh, from Lori Carson on uh, CCPP, uh, a little bit more in-depth for developers. Um, yesterday morning, uh, Linlin gave a presentation on uh, a general overview, scientific overview and some in-depth scientific information on CCPP, so this will be more, I believe, for uh, developers. So Lori, uh, feel free to go ahead. Okay, thank you, um, Jeff. <clears throat> yeah, so my talk is gonna focus on the common community physics package, as Jeff mentioned, and how to use, or what it is and how to use it if you want to um, start developing new physics schemes, modifying existing ones, changing a suite around. Uh, we've thrown around a lot of these terms over the last few days. And so this is just giving some more in-depth background. I'm not going to go into the details of the code management process because I think Mike and Dom covered that very well already this morning. So this is going to be much more um, in, in a different direction in how to use the CCPP and how to use the code. Um, once you get your changes, then you'd go through the whole process of the PRs and the forks and all of that. Um, so we will start with defining what is the CCPP, which is um, actually a question a lot of people have, uh, have about it, um, how it fits within a modeling system, um, how are CCPP physics suites defined, and what makes a piece of code CCPP compliant. Um, so that's sort of the foundations of CCPP. And then the next question, of course, is how does a host model use a CCPP? Um, most of my information here is about the UFS weather model because that's what we've been talking about all week. Um, but there are other host models that can use uh, the CCPP as well. Uh, I have some links at the end that have a lot more details and descriptions about this whole process. Um, there's a lot of documentation, previous presentations, um, YouTube videos, user's guides, all kinds of information. So to start, the CCPP, the Common Community Physics Package, is an infrastructure for physics development. And the goal is for this infrastructure to facilitate the improvement of physical parameterizations 
and our tr transition from research to operations. And it does this by enabling the community to participate in the development and testing. Uh, so the goal is to have researchers do new development in the CCPP framework, which is then fairly easily um, incorporated into an operational modeling system once it's demonstrated benefit. Uh, the CCPP consists of three different repositories that are listed here at the bottom. Um, and I'll go through each one of these on the next slides in more detail. Um, again, the goal for the CCPP is to have a consolidated library of operational and development um, physics parameterizations that all applications can pull from so they can construct a suite definition file using different um, schemes and different um, different orders, different ways of subcycling. There's a lot of control. Um, the CCPP is well supported. It's community code. Um, it's uh, hosted on GitHub and has open accessible development practices. Um, there's a code owners and PR process and testing and all of that that's um, well-defined and open to community developers. The clear interfaces is probably the key uh, benefit to the CCPP. So the interfaces between physics and its host model, whatever that might be, is well documented and defined so that you can use existing parameterizations and know what you're using. You can add a new parameterization with a clear interface. Um, by doing all of these steps, we end up with an interoperable physics, which is usable with other die cores. Um, there's always, you know, the devil's in the details with other die cores, but there's been a lot of work done on this and it's actually making good progress on being used in other die cores. Okay, so the first repository that I'm going to talk about is the CCPP physics. Um, Dom was making changes in that this morning and showed how to open a PR. This is the primary authoritative repository for the physical parameterizations standard nomenclature for physics schemes, they all belong here. Um, th this particular repository has operational physics schemes as well as candidates for upcoming implementations. So there, it's a good um, opportunity to test um, new schemes, to test tuning of schemes, et cetera. Um, Mike talked about forks in GitHub, which are used to develop a, a branch for a new feature. But there's another way forks can be used with CCPP physics, and that's um, if an institution wants to create a fork that their developers would work together on, and then when that development is mature, they would open the PR through their institutional fork back to the authoritative repository. So there's a lot of power in um, having these repositories on GitHub with the forking process. Um, and let's see, I think that's all I want to say about this for now. Uh, the CCPP framework repository is the second part of this. Um, it's also a sub in the UFS weather model. Um, it is a set of generalized software scripts that provide a framework for connecting the physical parameterizations with the host application. So in, in our case for this week, the host application is the UFS weather model. It could be the UFS single column model, or it could be the Neptune model or the MPAS model or whatever other host model you might have. But this framework um, takes the well-defined interfaces and generates code that connects the physics with the host model, usually dynamics. Um, the CCPP doc repository is a third repository that contains only documentation. Um, we made this choice because the technical documentation covers both the framework and the physics and, and also some examples of host models. So it felt like it didn't belong in one of the other repositories. And so it has its own repository. Um, so it describes the physics interfaces, the framework and the host model interfaces. Um, the technical documentation is hosted by Read the Docs, and there's a link here um, for, the, for the different versions of the technical document. So I'm going to do a little bit of um, a little bit more defining of terms here before we get into details. Uh, CCPP scheme 
is a term we've thrown around a lot this week. Um, any piece of code with a CCPP compliant interface could be called a scheme. Traditionally, it's the physical parameterizations of a physical process, as well as what's referred to in our nomenclature as interstitial schemes. Um, I'll define interstitial schemes a little bit later. But the code needs to be wrapped in a Fortran module, and it has to contain init, run, and finalize subroutines. There's a couple of other subroutines that are optionally um, available, um, time step init and some others. Um, it must contain CCPP readable metadata describing the arguments for all these three subroutines. And that's one of the key definitions of the, of the well-defined interface is exactly what input and output data this physics scheme needs. Uh, it must use the CCPP error tracking variables rather than doing a, a print and stop within the code. Um, scientific and technical documentation and modern coding standards. In general, our advice is that the, the CCPP scheme should be as smallest functional unit that is possible or reasonable. So it, sometimes it's hard to know how to divide up a scheme into pieces. Should I put it all in one monster, you know, physics part one, or should I divide it up into, you know, cumulus and radiation and other things, um, or shallow and deep convection? How, how do I decide whether they should be the same in one scheme or in separate parts? Um, and generally, the guideline is that if the scheme functions are always called together, so you, you can't envision a way that you'd want to split this apart and run part of it, but not other parts of it, or you'd want to run one part first and another part later on in the code, then, you, then it's okay to keep a pretty big chunk of code together as one scheme. Um, by dividing it up into smaller pieces, however, you give more uh, flexibility for future users to uh, call parts of your scheme. Uh, see, this slide has uh, got a lot of nice um, details and words on it. I don't think I'll go through it in a whole lot of detail because we've already talked about some of it. But the, the goal of interoperability um, is achieved through having a lot of standard practices um, and well-defined entry points for the code. I think the well-defined entry points and the metadata describing the inputs and outputs is the key part of this interoperability. Um, readability of the code for debugging, um, constants and tuning parameters are generally exposed through the argument list because one model might have a nameless input, another model might have a param file input, another model might have some other way to get input for tuning parameters. If those come into your scheme through the argument list, then you don't have to care how the host model got a hold of those. Um, derived and compound data types are um, a way to make your scheme not very interoperable um, because those are usually defined at the host model level. Standardized error handling, of course. Um, these are some additional thoughts when you're writing your, or when you're looking at your physics scheme or when you're writing a new one. Um, the metadata needs intents for its variables, input or output or both. Um, the private and public declarations need to be carefully defined um, using the constants and tuning parameters from the host model. Um, I guess one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that the CCPP assumes that the physical parameterizations are column oriented so that there is not parallelization across a grid within the physics scheme. Um, so you should have, your physics scheme needs to be at the level of a column. You can send in blocks of columns, but they can't exchange information. Okay, uh, primary and interstitial schemes. This is a, just a naming convention. There's really no difference in terms of the software, what's in each one. Um, primary scheme is a parameterization that fits the traditionally defined um, nomenclature for parameterizing a physical process. Um, interstitial key schemes are those pieces of code that are needed 
either before or after or between a physics scheme to do data preparation, to calculate diagnostics, um, to move variables around, um, whatever's needed to kind of glue the different physics schemes together. This code is traditionally in a model is included in a physics driver and it's included between calls to the different physics. So after radiation, you do some calculations and then call microphysics or something. That stuff that you do in between, we put into a interstitial scheme so that it can be more explicit. Um, this is a graphic that shows um, how the CCPP fits within the modeling system. So we've talked about the metadata that goes with the CCPP physics schemes. That's a list of all the inputs and outputs for in the argument list for each scheme. And the, the atmosphere driver or the host model has a very similar set of metadata that says, here's all the variables that I have that I can provide to the physics. The CCPP framework is that um, infrastructure set of scripts that takes these two metadata tables along with your suite definition file and automatically generates these caps that connect the atmosphere with the physics. It says here, I'm gonna line up all the right physics or the, all of the right variables from the atmosphere, you know, the dynamics, and I'm gonna put them in the right calls to call the physics. Um, it means that once you've done this metadata table for your physics scheme, you don't really have to worry about that, you know, writing all that code that calls everything. It's all auto-generated. So one of the key parts of the CCPP in use is called a suite definition file. Uh, Lynn Lynn talked extensively about the suite definition files for the short range weather app yesterday. Um, the sweet definition file is a XML file that puts together a list of physics parameterization parameterizations and in what order to call them and some more details about how to call them. So the top level element in this XML file is the suite. So there's a suite name. I have an example on the next slide and we'll go through this again. Um, within a, a suite definition file, there are, there's the option to have multiple groups. Um, all of the schemes listed within one group will be called together as a, a sequence. But from one group to the next, the host model can do something else in between. They can do a coupling time step or they can go read some more input data or something else. So the group is one way to control the order of execution of your physics schemes. Uh, Subcycling allows you to subcycle or to repeat a set of schemes within a group n number of times. That might be Thompson Microphysics needs to go five more times um, to have a, an effective smaller time step. Or it might be some surface parameterizations that need to do a couple of iterations for some kind of convergence um, or something. So subcycling is an option that's available. Subcycle equals one means just run through those schemes once. And then a list of schemes in each group and each subcycle. So this is an example of a XML suite definition file. Um, these are used at build time for the UFS weather model or any host model um, to generate those caps. So it's generating Fortran code that will call all of these things in the right order. So let's see. So the first thing is that the suite name here is listed here. This happens to be GFS v16. The group name in this example, here's a group that's named physics. Um, the subcycle, uh, the surface iteration or the surface schemes have a subcycle of two. That means that this whole set of schemes will be executed twice um, within this group. And then there's a whole list of schemes. So within each group and in each subcycle, there's a whole list of schemes that get executed. In this example here with our TMG, you can see that we've named some of them as a pre, some of them as a shortwave pre, a shortwave post, longwave pre. Uh, so those are all interstitial schemes that are computing some diagnostics or changing some units or 
moving things around to prepare the data for the next scheme. And the two physical parameterization schemes are the short wave and the long wave scheme. Sometimes these pre and post um, interstitials are specific to a scheme. Sometimes they're more generic and any radiation scheme will need this. So that, that's a naming convention. It, they could be named anything, um, but oftentimes the uh, model specific um, behavior of these sweet definition files are in the pre and the post. The physics schemes are pretty interoperable, but the data preparation, the computing diagnostics are sometimes uh, model specific. So this is a basic code structure example, and I shout out to Grant Furl for putting this together. Um, this is an example of a new scheme. So it's in a Fortran module. It contains the name of the scheme underscore init and run and finalize. Um, only run has argument list and it and finalize do not in this case, that's okay. Um, but the run has the error message and error flag, which are required arguments there. This is an extra section that's required um, in order to support our documentation. So this is a hook in the uh, metadata for Doxygen to read the CCPP metadata and include all of that in our scientific documentation. So once again, you've listed all the metadata, all the inputs and outputs, and all of their units and names. And now it's all included in your documentation without having to have it in two places. This is an example of some scheme metadata. So our, our same scheme, my scheme underscore run. Uh, the first, so the, the file is named my scheme dot meta, where the scheme itself, the Fortran would be dot F90. There's some um, conventions on what needs to go in which sections. Um, this is the argument table for the run stage of this scheme. There's a name of a variable that shows up in that Fortran. So this is the local Fortran variable name called stress. And that's what your Fortran code for my scheme underscore run would reference when it wants to use this, either input or output. Um, the standard name is a key, uh, and it's critical that this standard name is spelled correctly and has the right underscores and everything else, because that key will be used to match it to a variable on the host model or die core side. Uh, there's a long name that can be more descriptive, and that will show up in the documentation uh, units. We are uh, working on adding some capability to do some automatic unit conversions, especially for early testing of schemes. It's unlikely that you'd want to do that in a production environment, but if you want to just, I wanna try this different um, microphysics scheme, but it has different units, I'll just do the unit conversion and see if it works, and then I'll make it more Fortran efficient later. So th that's why units are included here. The, the standard, the dimensions use standard names for how, for the dimension, whether it's vertical levels or horizontal um, loop extent or et cetera. They can be start colon end or just one with this default start of one. Uh, the Fortran intrinsic type and kind. Um, the intent can be in, in, out, or out. Um, Fortran optional is also an op uh, listed here in the metadata. This, this uh, section at the top of the metadata file applies to the entire scheme. And this is where you could list dependencies. If your scheme requires some other um, Fortran code that's not in the same module file, you can list it here and make sure it gets compiled when your scheme gets compiled. Um, CCPP error handling is handled through this error message and error flag um, to arguments that are intent out 
in each um, scheme. So the, the intent here, not intent in or out, but the purpose is to assign a meaningful error message to the string and set error flag to a non-value or non-zero value. That triggers the host model to do something. Uh, if it sees an error flag other than zero, it will um, do something with this error message and stop or go on or whatever is appropriate. Um, I mentioned the standard names that are used for the variables, and that's the key that is matched string to string to define the local variables in the physics and the local variables on the DICOR or host model side. Um, there has been good progress in recent months towards a standard name dictionary, which is um, being developed by NOAA and NCAR with some inputs from others as well. Um, there's an active discussion going on in this repository. It's a code repository that has the dictionary of standard names. And we've started filling it with the standard names that are used by the UFS models um, and hope to be able to add um, standard names used by other models. That way, if you know you need something that's like a potential temperature on hybrid levels or something, you can go find what its name is, and then you can get that variable from the FE3 DICOR or whatever model you're using. So that's an ongoing effort. If there's somebody who has a particular interest in standard names, um, feel free to speak up. Um, we started the standard names using the CF conventions for meteorology uh, variables. They quickly um, need more refinement at the physics um, parameterization level. So we've expanded them and are working that from that, but trying not to um, break the CF conventions too much. Um, CCPP inline and scientific documentation uses doxygen. So if you're developing a new scheme, we would expect you to add some doxygen documentation to the scheme. Um, it can be additive to whatever is already in your source code. Comments um, are good in the code anyway. Um, the metadata table is parsed into HTML and included with this documentation. So that documents all your argument lists right there. Um, and here's a link to where that is posted. So the, the first one here is a scientific documentation and that's you know, scheme by scheme. It describes the science and the inputs and outputs and sort of the structure of the physics schemes. The CCPP tech doc, which I started, I talked about at the beginning from that third repository is here. And it's more of a, user's guide mechanics of using CCPP, um, less so about the science of what schemes are doing what in terms of um, actually parameterizing the atmosphere. Um, this is a slide I just grabbed from somewhere else. It just has a lot of good information on it about coding standards, uh, miscellaneous uh, suggestions. If you're writing a new scheme or if you're hoping to incorporate an existing scheme into CCPP. Um, here's some guidelines. So modern Fortran standards, uh, labeled end statements, implicit none, pretty common sense. They aren't super strict. Um, all intent, all variables or arguments should have an intent, no go-to and no common blocks. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on and talk about the host side just a little bit. Um, the, uh, see, so th this is described in the technical documentation, how to do the host side coding. Um, there's, so there's a similar metadata file for the host. The host could be a full atmospheric model. It could be a single column model. It could be any other um, driver for the physics schemes. It could be a, Probably it could be a parameter, parameter test, parameterization test harness of some kind. Um, so there's host metadata and it lists all the variables that it provides to the physics. Um, there's calls added within the code to call the different um, CCPP init, run, and finalize. 
Um, the parallelism is handled in the on the host model side. So if you're dividing up over MPI in X and Y, or if you've got tiles, um, or however your model domain is, is divided up, that would happen on the host model side. Um, CCPP is included at build time. So at the build time for the UFS weather model or the single column model, one can list a number of suite definition files to compile, or it can scan the directory and compile all of them in a directory. So the, the host model data for the UFS weather model is in this directory that's listed here. Um, FE3 CCPP data, GFS type def stop meta. Some of this naming convention is sort of a legacy, um, but that's where we're at. Um, sometimes other files will also have metadata, uh, primarily to help define some data structures that are still used in the UFS um, derived data types. Um, there are a few differences in the metadata compared to the scheme metadata, the type is either DDT or module rather than scheme. Um, the optional and intent in or out metadata are not used on the host side. Um, another option is that variables can be listed as having an active attribute. So active can be true or false. And um, this can tell the host or tell the CCPP whether or not this variable is going to be um, allocated at runtime. So it can be active on a logical expression like a flag. And if that flag is true, then um, the variable is allocated and it will be available for physics scheme. So that's a, a dependent, it's an allocation that's dependent on whether or not you've selected that uh, variable or a scheme with that variable. Um, this just describes you know, what I've said a couple of times already that the parallelism in the CCPP is, or for physics schemes using the CCPP is handled outside of the CCPP. So physics are column based. There's no communication across um, grid points or tiles during the physics step um, time integration. Um, physics init and finalize um, do not depend on the threading strategy of the model. So they are they can like read a whole file and distribute it to all the tiles. The MPI communications, again, are only in the physics initialize and finalize. Um, and they use a communicator provided by the host model, not a more generic one that's often used in um, models. OpenMP um, can be used, so threading can be used within a physics scheme. Um, using the OpenMP directives, uh, the, the threads are provided by the host model. So that's a one kind of parallelization that can be done in CCPP. Um, so the, the next topic is talking about what actually happens at build time for CCPP compliant physics. So the, the CCPP framework is script-based and it's primarily a Python script, and it's called during the build, during the CMake build of your UFS weather model or your single column model or whatever other model you might have. The script is given a set of you know, sweet definition files, and it will compile code to drive each one of those sweet definition files. So it re reads all the scheme metadata, it reads all the host metadata, and it matches the variables from the host to the physics. Um, this is using those standard names. So that's where the standard names have to match. It auto generates a suite and a group cap that then the host model can run um, wherever it, find, it, it is appropriate within that host model. Uh, it auto generates a make file information so that all the physics and caps can be built within the host model build system. Um, it's been used and tested for several years. It's robust. Um, I think it's a pretty slick way to define those interfaces um, without having to actually type in argument lists anymore. 
Um, so the, the future direction for the CCPP is to continuing exp um, contributions and partnering with other organizations. There's an active participation with NCAR, especially on the framework um, pieces, um, but also discussions on sharing physics uh, more explicitly, uh, continuing adding and improving the existing schemes. Uh, there's talk often about chemistry and some other um, kind of different flavored schemes um, rather than the traditional physics ones. They have their own unique characteristics like the number of species and things in chemistry, the number of um, molecules. How do you handle that in a metadata file? Um, the CCPP framework is currently using a Python script um, that was written several years ago called CCPP Prebuild. Um, our goal is to transition to a different um, Python script that is being co-developed with NCAR um, called capgen.py. So if anybody here is transitioned to capgen, that's what this is about. Um, it's an ongoing process, um, perhaps a little underfunded, uh, but we're working on it. Um, usability improvements, um, better diagnostics and documentation for the, from the framework when it's running. Um, things like that. Um, there's often discussion about a Nuopsy interface for CCPP suites. Um, Nuopsy is a coupling interface that it's often used for the more major components like ocean and ice and things like that. Um, it seems reasonable that a CCPP suite or suite definition file could be wrapped in a Nuopsy interface and treated as a coupled component. That would take a little work. Um, so that's another future development possibility. Um, I've listed here several links um, to different resources. Um, given the time that we have today and the um, what you've already listened to already all day today, there's a lot of technical detail. I am not planning to go through a careful example of how you would add a scheme, but there are examples in some of these YouTube videos. Um, there's forums where you can ask questions. There's uh, technical documentation, scientific documentation. Um, there's recordings of previous trainings that we've done generally on the GitHub Wiki pages for the different parts. Um, so I, there's a lot of resources about exactly how to do this. If you have a brand new scheme that you want to work on, we often suggest that people start with a single column model because interfacing to that's a little bit easier than interfacing to FE3. If you're already comfortable with FE3, then that's fine. Um, so that's all the material that I had prepared. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them or hope some of my colleagues online can answer them as well. Thank you, Lori. Uh, we do have one question or actually two questions from June in the Slack channel, presentations channel. Um, the first one, she's asking about, I believe she's asking about Thompson code, uh, TM code. Uh, and saying that the version is, is different based on what's in the app, uh, V101 versus um, what uh, is in the actual CCPP physics repo. So obviously, when we made the, uh, the app release, the code was older. Um, so she's asking if there's a way that you can selectively run the app, but with the newer um, Thompson code or TM code, uh, which I think is referring to Thompson. So I mean, my guess is you would just, you know, in the externals file, you would just check out the develop branch of UFS weather model. I'm not sure if there's another way, you know, that she would do that, Lori. Right. I guess my advice would be to use an updated version of the whole UFS weather model and not try to update just one physics scheme. Yeah. And that actually brings up a question that I've had for CCPP. Is there a way to go back and run older versions or you always you always have to run you know whatever is the latest i guess you can go back and grab an, an old hash but you never right. know you know there's is there any documentation on the hashes and what versions of the physics those are uh, correspond with well so every change goes through a pull request so you could look through the git logs and see true 
when was this added or when was this not added? I want to go back before it was added or something like that and pull out that hash. Um, we do not do like frequent tags of capabilities. Um, it's an interesting. Yeah, idea, that's but. That's what I was wondering if, you know, like we would have with WERF or you'd have like a physics update and it would have an official version number or something like that. I mean, I guess it was tied to the WERF version itself. Um, right. So, so there's yeah. Version, yeah, there's version tags for the, each of the apps that have been released. So short range yes, weather, yes, right. range yeah. weather, those kinds of things are all tagged. And we usually tag an independent S, or CCPP release that is bundled with a single column model yet with each of those app releases as well. But, but there are no more finer grains than that. That was, yeah, that was my question is whether the physics developers, you know, if, if they have arrived at a point where they feel that they would like to personally tag their code and say, this is this, I'm at a point now where I want to tag it and say, this is as good as it's going to be for the moment, or I've just implemented a major change and I want to tag it. I guess it's something that would have to be looked into in the future. Right. Um, okay, um, and then the second question from June, I see Julie has his hand up as well. June says, I found that the C preprocessor flags are employed in some codes. Uh, and then she references WERF 3.81. Uh, is it processed using a single definition file or needed to be specified at the start of each code? I'm not 100% sure I understand the question, so we might need clarification. But yeah. the, the C preprocessing flags are passed down through the CMake build system. Um, but whether or not the make files in each component actually use those is a different question. I believe that the UFS weather model has a consistent set of CPP flags for the preprocessor flags all the way through all of its components. Okay, um, yeah, Dom actually responded. Dom, I okay. see your hands up. Do you wanna to add to that? So I think in this specific case, um, this is a hard coded <clears throat> switch that we put in that is defined at the top of the file or it's not defined. And that is not part of the build system at all, but others like um, uh, whether something is compiled with multi gases support or whatever it is, um, these ones are defined by the host model build system and they're passed down. So both of them are is both of them are possible. Okay. Okay. Ideally, of course, we don't use it because it's just confusing another layer of complexity. Okay. Thanks, Dom. Uh, Julie, do you have a question? Yeah. So uh, if there is a if there is a mismatch between the input nimlist parameter and the CCPP Felix suite for certain schemes, uh, sometimes the model still can run but with unexpected results. I'm wondering uh, if there are a way to add some check in the, in the code, like to check if CCPP scheme is actually matched with the input name list options. Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question, Julie, because I know there are some redundancies baked into the name list and CCPP. So I'm wondering, Lori, if you have any comments you wanted to add about that? Uh, sure. I mean, that, that is a well-recognized and known issue. And um, the CCPP development team has discussed some different ways of approaching that. And as a first pass, we are likely to just add checks in the physics init phases. So in Thompson init, you check and see if MP physics equals eight, and if not, exit. Um, we have not implemented those yet. So we know it's a problem. And it's a frustration having to keep those two synchronized. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, we have implemented some of them, but we are definitely not consistent. <clears throat> and ideally, there would be one for each of those suites. So the solution that you mentioned, Laurie, that would consist of having a, a way to identify which scheme in a suite definition file represents a certain process. And that would allow the CCPP to automatically set those flags. So from that, from that solution that we, <clears throat> we are planning, to implement, we would get a, the CCPP framework would automatically set IMP physics correctly in the FE3 code. Mm -hmm. Right, the first is to check it and then to um, actually just set the variables so they match. 
Yeah, I mean, ultimately, and I know, Laura, you've mentioned this in the past, you really shouldn't have anything in the name list related to the physics unless it's something that's user definable that, you know, you could change within the physics. If it's just something related to physics in the SDF, then maybe it shouldn't even be in the name list, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jeff, that depends because the host model sometimes needs to know these things. So you need to have some okay, I guess I figured tell the host model what physics, what microphysics, for example, you're running. Okay, and so maybe sometimes that's only defined in the name list and it's not passed to the model any other way. That's what you're saying. No, what I'm saying is, <clears throat> excuse me, when if Thompson microphysics is chosen, then the host model also does things differently than if, for example, GFDL microphysics is used because it has different tracers. It needs to know all this stuff for communicating with other components with the IO system, allocating arrays. So you need right. to translate sweet definition file contents with, it, with which is an XML file into Fortran logic. And that's where the solution that I mentioned comes into play. Right. I guess I was thinking that that should happen under the hood and not necessarily rely on a nameless setting. Yeah, exactly. On, that nameless yeah. setting would go away. It would become a parameter that CCP sets. You're completely correct. Right, okay. Okay, any other questions for Lori? I don't see any in Slack right now. We still have 15 minutes before, I believe 15 minutes before we transition the open discussion and QA. Um, but we can, we can move on to that right now. Um, if there are no more questions. Yeah, I was, I was curious if we, if we wanted to move directly on or just take a break since we did have an early, uh, an early lunch today. We can certainly do that. People are in favor of a quick 15 minute break. We can come back and start the discussion then. I'm in favor of the break just because I know it's okay. been a long week and a long All afternoon, right. so. Yes, it, ha it has been. So, all right, we will reconvene in, in 15 and start things then. All right, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to round the day out today with an open question and answer period. And Mike, um, well, I'll hand it over to you. I don't know if you have some prepared slides or if, we're, if you're just going to open it up or how you want to proceed from here. So I'll, I'll just toss it over to you and let you take it away. Sure. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I didn't know I didn't have any slides. Um, so this uh, is kind of a open session that we uh, started with the medium range weather app tutorial and have continued for, for this training. Um, and uh, we're kind of hoping that this is, would uh, give students a chance to ask questions they may have had um, from earlier in the week or haven't, uh, haven't had them fully answered or just uh, in general to uh, kind of Q and A with the instructors and subject matter experts that, that we have here. Um, so uh, I guess first I'll ask if, if anyone has a question that they, they thought they had answered or hadn't had answered or just was curious about related to the short range weather app. And if not, I have uh, put a set of questions together um, partially based on some chatter I saw on Slack earlier this week and also uh, just some topics for general discussion. Um, so I guess I'll start with the uh, first one. Um, sorry, I forgot to note um, who had asked these questions originally, but um, there was a question um, just about the UFS in general and uh, talking about the uh, overall picture of the various components, um, they're uh, asking what the role of coupling will be um, in, the, uh, in the future of the short range weather app, or I guess the uh, UFS in general. I 
I guess I can start answering that question by saying, um, that, well, currently the there there is a coupling available, I believe, and someone will correct. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but at least one of the um, UFS applications, the seasonal, the S2S subseasonal, the seasonal application does take um, coupling, at least ocean coupling into account. And I believe the idea in general, at least for the global, is to uh, incorporate some of these in the future as well. Um, and hopefully one of the uh, uh, more global focused people can tell me if that was correct or not. Uh, I see Dom's hand is up there, so go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the next implementation of the global GFS version 17 is a fully coupled model that includes um, <clears throat> the ocean component, the ice component, <clears throat> the wave for three component. That one has already been released as part of GFS version 16. So this this application is definitely fully coupled, whether that's in short term forecasting or in, in sub seasonal to seasonal forecasting mode. And the halves as well, by the way. So the hurricane um, application as well. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, uh, yeah, this, this, this is Hendrik. Uh, sorry, I, I I just want to interrupt you. Um, I just got a message that um, there there is a different Zoom link in the calendar invite, so there may be some people who are trying to call in who aren't able to get in since we're using the same Zoom link as this morning. Um, I don't know how you wanted to to handle that. I'm wondering if, if Brett can direct those people to this Zoom link. If if he, Brett, can you log into that other? Um, I can't without leaving this meeting. Um, I can't. Or, okay. Yeah. Uh, what I would recommend is sending everyone an email saying that you're using the Zoom link from this morning. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll Mike. I'll go ahead and try and do that. Okay. Um, sorry. Go ahead, Hendrik. Yeah, I was going to say pretty much the same as we said before. So in operations, the global wave model is now one-way coupled to GFS, so that has been compacted into one. Uh, the technology would allow you to do two-way coupling, but for now we're just doing one way. Uh, the GEFS uh, is uh, also uh, doing a one-way coupling to the uh, to the wave ensemble in full in full uh, uh, in full uh, mode, full ensemble mode, and has a control run. With a one-way coupled uh, aerosol in there, and so so we're moving that way. And we have a the other one that uh, that uh, was talked about. There is a prototype four-way coupled system uh, that we have been testing, which is going to be the uh, prototype of the either sub-seasonal or seasonal model, the new the new CFS, uh, which would you call the SFS. And then uh, you can go a step further uh, with the RRFS and with the HER. We're now looking at uh, using input from the um, uh, Great Lake circulation ice and wave models, or circulation ice models, uh, to do uh, uh, better uh, lake effect snow and that kind of stuff. And uh, the uh, HAFS is also moving towards what is already done operationally in the H wharf in terms of having a wave model, wave model and ocean model coupled in there. So the applications may not necessarily have that, the supported applications, but uh, the code stack is definitely there, and particularly on the global side, that code stack is pretty mature because we're in the seventh, or we, I should say EMC, is in the seventh step of doing the benchmarking for this, uh, which basically means that uh, that uh, the thing looks actually pretty darn good. And so this is a little bit about the same things that was mentioned a few times earlier here uh, today. Uh, the applications are there really to make sure that it's easy for somebody to get started. Uh, but once you know how to work with these systems, you really want to look to the whole code stack and see what actually is available, and not just not just for the application you're looking at. But if you're if you're getting uh, uh, familiar and and confident with working with one of these applications, then it should be a lot easier for you to pick up something like that prototype that is sitting fully open available in GitHub. But we don't have a uh, uh, the the support mechanism for the for, for the release for the formal release behind it yet. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the the great information, um, Dom. I see your yeah. hand is up as well. Yeah, I just wanted to reply to Hendrik quickly. So um, within this whole epic public release effort, um, I think the understanding was that the next public release of the of the medium range weather will have to be a fully coupled, otherwise people will not be able to 
get that whole infrastructure with the coupled model um, up and running and you know get 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 used to it so they, they wouldn't be able to to get feedback for gfs version 17. so that's something that epic will have to deal with yeah so, sorry to jump in for a, a little more but to add to what dom is saying this is basically uh, for talking uh, talking uh, now as the co-chair of the ufs we recognize that things like graduate student tests and like releases need to be done the right way and that uh, there's an enormous amount of power and value in that. Uh, we're just struggling with, uh, with uh, the resourcing and Epic hopefully will help out with that. And uh, there will be uh, potentially one of, the, one of the ways we could go forward, but we don't have made a hard decision on that yet, is that the next medium range uh, weather forecast release is literally a single release that would, co that, that would cover uh, uh, the GFS, the GEFS, and uh, the next version of the CFS, all in a single release, uh, with the with the with the modeling system that, uh, at least in terms of uh, the component models, uh, could be the same at all these scales, and then we can decide whether or not uh, which pieces we actually switch on operations as two-way coupled and which are one-way coupled, and which may still be uh, be uh, uh, left out. And uh, just a little bit of history: we've been, I've been talking as a marine guy for 20 years about coupling. And from a science perspective, it was very hard to get that true. But now that we're talking about simplifying the production suite, and one of the ways of simplifying the production suite is to make sure that even a dependent model does not have to wait until the main model is done. And you don't have to do a lot of very expensive IO to get a downstream modeling running. So the engineering reason for even doing just a one-way coupling like we're doing with the wave model right now in the GFS means that uh, we get much higher resolution forcing for free. We get much less I/O cost, and we are able to run this model way earlier than in the production suite. And so, this idea that we use uh, engineering reasons for doing the coupling rather than science reasons for the coupling is what pushes us really quickly into a fully coupled system. And then, between C maps and D maps, uh, you would be able to uh, switch out dynamic models or uh, data models for these things, and so making it one-way coupled or a downstream model down the way. So I find that really exciting where the where the science is going with that, and and particularly uh, what Mariana and and her team has done with uh, developing DMAPs uh, not too long ago as a really really strong tool for doing development of codes, either as component models or as co coupled models in exactly the same environment. So that's very exciting to me, even though I have very little time to actually do coding at the moment. Yeah, thanks for all that again. That's that's a great amount of information. Um, hey, Mike, I just I wanted to reiterate. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I just wanted to re reiterate one of the points that Hendrik made and one of the points that Dom made in his presentation, which is that the releases are really good to get people up and running, but once once they're really, you know, more or less experienced with the app and they understand how to build it, how to run it, and they actually want to use it for their own purposes. And maybe even develop code. Uh, we we really encourage people to please use the develop branches because development is happening so furiously. Um, this is a, everyone knows this is a new system. Um, we're we're spinning up with it regionally, um, which is even newer than the global. And we're getting just tons of bug fixes and new functionality that is available in the develop branch. Uh, that just even if it's a month uh, newer than the, the releases, you're just going to get uh, so many more uh, bug fixes and, and um, new features. So I, I would definitely encourage everyone to jump to the develop branch as soon as you can um, after you're uh, familiar and comfortable with the releases. Yeah, and, and I, I pointed that out on Monday, but we the way we're doing business with the community is completely different than what we used to do. Because if you would have wanted to pick up the her from from Noah, you had to go to the NCO tarball and pick up a file and see whatever you could do with that. Only after we went into operations and, uh, and Jacob and uh, and uh, uh, Curtis and their teams are are working on an RRFS right now that is uh, uh, not scheduled to, to go into operations until about three years from now or thereabouts, give or take a half year. 
but the fact that you as a you as a developer can basically work with exactly the same code they are working with makes this a completely different dynamic of how we can can collaborate with the community and and the one thing that uh, i mean we went through this uh, about 10 12 years ago with the wave model we had a not project that was funded out of the office of naval research where we actually specifically test ran all these different type of ways of interacting with the community and so uh third th the third uh, time we're saying this but yeah work work with the most uh, up-to-date code once you're comfortable with that but the flip side of that is also stay up to date with that because one of the ways to make it really easy to get a lot of stuff in is to make sure that as a developer uh, every time that there's a new uh, uh, new stuff coming into uh, into the into the the what, what we used to call the trunk i was a subversion guy before make sure that you keep up to date with that because if you don't then by the time that you want to get your stuff merged back into the official version of the code uh, you're going to spend enormous amounts of time uh, exponentially more than when when you keep up to date continuously even in your development branch and those are some of the really small and like i said i haven't touched code in a few years but that was the one thing I learned that I never thought of would make sense. But once you're doing that, once people are getting used to that, you realize that that little bit of extra overhead saves you so much time down the road uh, when you have to reintegrate later that please, please, please do that. Yeah, great, great point, okay. Hendrik. Um, there was a question here, Mike, on Slack uh, about whether Coupling is on the horizon for the short range weather app. And uh, the answer is yes. And it's actually something that I was going to address in my talk tomorrow morning uh, at 9 a.m. Mountain Time, which is on uh, new features and future features for the short range weather app. Um, there are developers at both GSL and EMC, uh, Boulder and, and DC, who are working on um, coupling uh, the CMAC model, which is the air quality model, and uh, the national water model. Uh, and those will, uh, those are both being rapidly developed, um, and code commits are going in uh, weekly on on those uh, two coupled systems. Um, I can't speak too much more to um, you know details, but um, there are uh, developers who are actively working on that. I see Jacob has turned his video on, so I'll uh, I'll let him comment. Oh well, I just wanted to add maybe one more thing, um, and maybe maybe embarrass somebody uh, a little bit, which is always fun. Um, yeah, so it's just speaking, some of the coupling work is going on right now um, in terms of the Great Lakes, so uh, with FECOM. So David Wright uh, is a collaborator, and I think he's here, um, who's, who's someone that's already working on some of that as well. That's, so I just and I apologize, to, I apologize to you, Jacob, and to David. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, that, <laughs> I should have mentioned that, and I will include that in my slides. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was the first one to go in. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, since 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 uh, Jacob uh, is uh, is uh, stroking my marine ego here, uh, the uh, the last time that we updated the Great Lakes Wave model, uh, we uh, we uh, made sure that uh, the cadence and the run times of the Great Lakes Wave model. Is such that it is almost uh, almost a carbon copy of the rapid refresh, uh, except for the fact that uh, we would need uh, a slightly longer run on the on the long runs every six hours. But so so that is sitting on the side there too as something that uh, uh, we could simplify the production suite by doing a one-way coupling. And once that is in place, uh, it becomes a science issue to see if you want to feedback information of a. Uh, things like surface roughness and uh, spray and aerosols back into the other models or not. So that's another one that is sitting on the side there. And this is really interesting to look at this because we've literally worked between GLURL and NOS and uh, uh, EMC. We spent about 15 years on working and getting these models ready for to get at this level. And there used to be something called the Coastal Storms Initiative. We did a lot of the original um, original uh, investment in getting these models ready to the point where we are right now. Great, ex great example of uh, how a unified approach can leverage resources from all over the place and actually create collaboration opportunities between line offices, which in the past usually was not a really good thing, really easy thing to do. So thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. 
Um, so yeah, that was some some great discussion on uh, coupling and also some good advertisements for tomorrow's talks. And um, hopefully there's uh, gonna be a lot more um, questions uh, that can uh, be answered tomorrow. And we will also have a, a at least a brief open Q&A session tomorrow as well um, after those talks. Um, so I haven't seen any new questions uh, come in, so I'll move on to the next sort of topic for discussion, um, which is one that was asked earlier this week, but um, I thought was worth uh, bringing up again, which is the idea of containers. Um, and so uh, the question was um, that, does the UFS team have a plan to release container images? And um, the answer is uh, yes, actually, with the most recent tag, there was, uh, with the original release, there was a container released, uh, a Docker container, but it was not very well advertised. And so we've actually bumped up in the uh, user's guide for the most recent release that happened last week so that hopefully people can find some more information about that. Um, but I thought I would bring up this question uh, again to the bigger group to see if anyone else had, had more to add about that. Hello. All right. Hey, All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. So uh, I just wanted to say that we just uh, we we just uh, submitted a preprint to uh, geoscientific modeling development for a container we've developed with our uh, configuration of of, uh, of the UFS, which includes both a uh, global nested and a regional domain. So I can put the uh, I, I can put the link to the preprint in the uh, in, in the uh, in the in the text of the, in the log for this uh, uh, qu these questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, okay, thanks, Lucas. Yeah. And I'll include it here in the chat <laughs> so everybody can see it more easily. Okay, not hearing anything else on that. I guess I'll move on to the next question. I guess containers are always a, a wild card discussion topic because many people are, are interested in it and, and maybe many people have never heard of them before. So um, thanks, for the, thanks for the link again, Lucas. And uh, hopefully people who are interested can uh, take a look at that. Thank you. Okay, so the next uh, discussion topic. Um, so uh, I believe this, I cannot remember if this actually got an answer because the, there was a question in the Slack and I wasn't sure if it was answered verbally or not. Um, but the question was, can uh, the UFS short range weather app, can it take the output from the medium range weather app as ICs and BCs, or is it only the uh, like GFS official data releases that will work as input to the short range weather app? And I guess I'm not sure who would know that the answer to that question best. Um, I certainly don't want to put anybody on the spot, but uh, can can you say that one more time, Mike? What the question was. Sure. Yeah. The the question was: Would can, if you have uh, say a a global run of the medium range weather app, um, and you have the output from that, will that work as input to the short range weather app? Um, in general, or is it only things like the official GFS data, for example, that will work? So conceptually, yes. Um, I mean, so if we take a step back and look at the bigger picture, that's conceptually the, identical to what we're doing with the GFS output and feeding that into our RFS or any sort of FE3 LAM or HAPS run that you're doing. So. Uh, it should work. Now, have we tested that with the MRW app, taken the output from the MRW app itself and run it with the SRW app? I don't know that anyone's actually done it, but um, it it should work. Um, you know, I, I but we, we haven't tested that yet, but con conceptually, yeah, it, it should be fine. In fact, uh, you, you could probably, if you save the um, history files from that run, 
uh, change rise should be able to work uh, with that as inputs. Now, granted, um, I don't think the app is configured to work out of the box like that, but the codes and everything that are in there do support that. So there's probably a little bit extra legwork on the end of the user, but you know, it's not always bad. Yeah, Jacob, the, uh, is Larissa on? Larissa, if you're on, you she she actually worked on this at least to try and get some of the right component output um, read into Change Res Cube and use as initialization data. Um, so. I believe that that is an option. No, it's not in the app yet, and it's not even in the authoritative code repositories yet. But um, work has been has begun on that. Hopefully, that answers that question. Yeah, thanks, Jacob and Jeff. I think that uh, is a good, solid answer to that. And and as I mentioned, I think somebody did uh, provide an answer earlier, but it didn't make it into the into the text records. Um, so here's a, a question that um, I guess was probably uh, uh, answered in a bit in the CCPP talks, but the, the question is can, so there's only two supported CCPP schemes for the release, um, but what sort of effort is necessary to uh, use, say, the other uh, schemes that are already supported for the, the weather model um, or maybe for other applications? Can, what would it take to use those in the short range weather app? I, I can give that a try. Um, so the UFS weather model works with a large number of sweep definition files, and any of those are theoretically possible to run in the SRW app configuration. I think what has to happen is that the nameless template that matches that sweep definition file has to be um, constructed for the scripts that run, generate the workflow. And then there's a couple of places in the workflow where there's a list of approved suite definition files and you'd have to add it to that. So it's pretty minor, but it's you know, a little finicky to get the app to recognize that a new suite definition file is supported. Uh, Christina, I see your hand up. I just wanted to mention that we had done uh, quite a bit of this work for uh, our Rufus Ensemble on the cloud work. And um, as Lori mentioned, it, there are a couple of finicky places. Um, you also have to be aware if the specific physics um, scheme requires additional input at runtime. Um, and um, I believe in addition to nameless, there are some, some uh, a few other files that are required to be staged, depending on the, the physics options that you're using. Yeah, thanks for that extra info, Christina. Yeah, thanks. I was like about oh, the extra. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I say I always forget about the extra input data and like table lookup tables and things like that too. Yeah, we also. We had a couple that we needed to change, like the the variable lists and that. Oh, I think you muted yourself, Christina. I was done. Yeah, Mike, I was just going to, I see we have a question from Rajesh here. Um, I was just going to add that while they're unsupported, the app, especially the develop branch, has quite a few sweet definition files uh, that a user can try to run, um, and the app is more or less con uh, configured to run them. Again, right, right now they're unsupported, but um, some of them are uh, some configurations that EMC has been running. Uh, with GFDL microphysics, some of them are specifically based on uh, the HER model uh, and the RAP model um, using the physics suites that those two models uh, used. So there are some other options in there aside from the two that are supported, um, but again, they're use at your own risk, uh, of course. So Rajesh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And sorry, this, I am not sure if this has been discussed before because I was trying to join the other link and then, then I got the, the link to this meeting. So 
um, my main interest in using the the UFS app SRW app is to drive an air quality model CMAC. So um, I've been doing that with the the MRW app. So I'm wondering if if there has been any test comparing short range forecasts like 48 hour forecast uh, from both the MRW and SRW apps, and it means. Um, are there differences? If there are differences, are they big or small? So just wanted to get um, get your feedback on, on that aspect. Is, is Chen Hu on the call? He's been doing a lot of the, or most of the coupling work with, with CMAC in the short range weather app. If he's not, I don't know, Jacob, if you know any details on any tests that he has run? Uh, I guess I didn't catch the full question there. I mean, I, I, I guess the question was if there are differences in terms of forecast uh, quality between MRW and SRW apps. Yes. Does this, but, but does this relate to coupling at all or? No, it's not related to the coupling. I think it's okay. just the comparison of MRW and SRW. It means I'm asking this because um, MRW app is computationally more expensive to run. And so mm. I'm wondering if I should change to SRW app, app if it is producing similar level, similar quality of meteorological forecasts. Okay, I see what you're asking. Uh, what um, What's the forecast length that you're most concerned with? 48 hours. I think the limited area application that the SRW app provides is certainly um, a very reasonable option. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I can show some materials in a minute, but um, yeah, I, I think I think it'd be okay. Uh, are you planning on still running um, a grid resolution where you need to uh, exercise convective parameterization? No. So we, I am running the MRW app at 13 kilometer resolution because then okay. I'm I'm driving the air quality model at 12 kilometer resolution. So my okay. I would run SRW app also at 13 kilometer resolution. Um, okay. To, to prepare my meteorological inputs for the air quality model. Okay. So I mean, I certainly think it's worthwhile to try a limited area application. You will want to turn on some form of parameterized convection at a 13 kilometer yeah. grid spacing. Yeah. Um, you could uh, actually take the, now there will be extra leg work uh, that you'll need to do on your own, uh, most likely, but uh, you could basically borrow the physics configuration that's used for your MRW application mm -hmm. and then use that in your SRW. And yeah. you should get similar forecasts. Um, there'll probably be a little bit of degradation. It may not be quite as good as what you may get from the global forecast, um, but they should be close. Mm -hmm. And we have a paper, when we put together the limited area modeling uh, capability uh, for the FE3 dynamic core, we did run about uh, 30, 30 cases um, where we compared global with a nest versus just standalone uh, limited area configuration. And the results are very comparable for the first 24 hours, after which there's some slight degradation, but it's not, um, you know, anything, if, if computational efficiency is your concern, I think it's a good option for you to consider. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, and great. yeah, so so I, I guess means I will have to use the develop branch because for the MRW app, I was using GFS v16 beta. Um, and I think in the release SRW, we only have v15 yeah. and the, the v1 alpha for, for three kilometer. So okay. yeah, I, I would probably go ahead with the SRW app in the develop, um, develop mode. Yes, I think so, although I'm not the best person to ask. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, Jeff or Mike or Gerard or someone else uh, may, may, may have better uh, better perspective there on the, on the particulars of which version of the code is probably best for your, uh, for this type of app, like which, which flavor develop you want to grab and develop maybe something. Yeah, like this. means the reason I'm asking means like, because I, I'm, I'm working on a multi-year um, CMAX simulations during the wildfire seasons. And so, sorry, I didn't, don't want to drag the conversation to air quality. And then I, I ran the MRW app for four years from 2017 to 2020. 
um, means for summer seasons, and that itself consumed like two million core hours. And so, um, so that is the reason that that I, I plan to run a couple of more years. And I was thinking like maybe I should switch to SRW app. Then that will bring down the computation requirement significantly. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to compromise the quality of the results. So that's why I, I asked this question. Yeah. yeah just, okay. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I was just going <laughs> to say. Uh, go ahead. I'll. I'll... Okay. Um, you could do a one-off forecast. Uh, so you could take the SRW app, do a 48 hour forecast for a case in which you've already done. See how similar they are. And you can probably give that, you know, you could, you could probably help use that to kind of help guide some of your decision-making there before you kind of, mm -hmm. if you want to, if you're a little hesitant about jumping in with both feet, that mm -hmm. would be my suggestion. And since I'm, yeah, sorry, Jeff, do you have something to add? I was just going to say that, you know, based on what Jacob has shown the other day is if you're running a nothing, you know, really long into, you know, 100 hour forecast range. And if your domain is large enough that your area of interest is separated from the LBCs uh, for long enough of a period of time, uh, then you don't have to worry. I mean, you've seen the comparison between the global versus the regional and, and the, the, the quality of the forecasts are very close in the first two days. So I think that's a, a good sign that you can probably move forward with the regional and, and save some of the computation, uh, computational expenses, so. Thank you. And so means because I will, because I'm, I'm also running the air quality model in the forecast mode, which means that I do a cold start every day from the 0 0.25 degree GFS forecast. So should I consider some spin up time or um, before I, start using the, the SRW output for, for air quality model? Yeah, re required spin up time for air quality is not something I can speak to. Um, Chandu... No, not for, the, not for the air quality, but for the weather parameters. Oh. I means you can see that you start from a 0 0.25 degree resolution as you go through the the model output frames, then you would you would start to see like maybe after six hours, you start to see finer resolutions appearing in the in the model output. So yeah, there's always going to be a spin up issue for cold starts, um, regardless of the domain or global versus regional. So yeah, you're going to want to not really rely on the first six to twelve hours um, necessarily as as the period of interest. If that is your period, then you want to initialize before yeah um, to get out past six to twelve hours. Yeah, just as a Park. Yeah, I mean, so I just I was using like twelve hours as a spin up for the MRW. Maybe I can continue doing that for for the SRW. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and again, take a look at your output too. Um, if you have, you know, a lot of terrain, it, it may be a little bit quicker. Um, but you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, Lucas. Have have you all has GFDL looked at that for uh, doing cold starts with higher resolution? How long it kind of takes things to get spun up to at the appropriate scales just on average? Um, so actually, it's glad that you mentioned that because I mentioned that in my uh, 2019 paper on our uh, global regional continental convection nested runs. And we actually found that the kinetic energy spectrum actually spins up in about six hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. That's yeah, there you go. Oh, thank you. Yeah, all right. It means I think the, the SRW, the, the 13 kilometer tunnel domain covers my um, air quality domain. Actually, I'm using the same domain as the national air quality forecasting capability. So I, I still have to test if, uh, if my domain is within the 13 kilometer, otherwise I have to define a new domain. But, but still good to know that the, the accuracy of SRW and MRW are close enough. Thank you. And I'll just add on top of that, um, based on some of our, our recent tests, we found that the, the, ma the majority of the uh, increased error is in the first six hours. So if you wanted to be especially cautious, um, you could use a 12 hour spin up time, but um, it didn't, at least in our tests, it didn't reach the level of statistical significance past six hours. Thanks, Michael. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any other any other hands up or follow-up questions? 
Uh, so I'll move on to the, the next topic of uh, discussion. Um, may, so, I another, may I ask another one? Oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so when, when I was running the MRW app, um, I, I couldn't run it with the GFS data before 2017. Means like if I try to run 2016, then um, like the CH, the change res uh, program worked fine. But then I had some like no defined number errors in the MRW app. I think I also posted this in the in the Slack on one of the days. And Lin Lin, Lin suggested that we probably have to make changes, some changes to to change rest code to make it work with uh, with data before 2016, because there was probably a format change in the in the grip to format or something uh, that um, that has not been considered. So, so yeah, my question is, um, are there plans to make those changes to the change rest code so that we can also run the SRW app for years before 2016? Yeah, Rajesh, so you said you successfully ran change rest cube with GFS data from 2016, but it crashed in the model? Yeah, it, I think it prepared the input data but then the model crashed. The model didn't. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like. Do you? I mean, do you remember offhand what the crash was specifically? Yeah. Okay. No, I can, um, I can try to reproduce that case and, and share it with you. If you can, yeah. Can you post that in the UFS forum initialization section? Uh -huh. um, and then a number of us who do some of the pre-processing can take a look. It's probably some field that maybe got ignored or wasn't correctly. Uh, initialize that maybe the model needs, you know, there's probably something different in the grip two files. It's, it's probably an easy fix uh, in the change res cube code. Another if statement for data older than a certain year um, that we can, we can take a look at. Yeah. So if you do have a chance to, to rerun that and you can actually post the, uh, the error itself uh, in the, in the forum, we can take a look. Sure. And, yep. All right. Rajesh, can you also, when you do that, can you post where you got the data from, like a link to it? Oh yeah. Because then I could, I could, my my gut feeling is there's a tracer that was named differently then than it is now, mm -hmm. and so you were getting some weird values in the tracer array because that seems to be what's been changing the most. Um, but I can, it shouldn't take me long to figure it out if I if I have a copy of whatever data you used, and then we can work with you. Sure, Larissa, it's, it was the, the data from NPAR Research Data Archive, but I will, okay. I will sure share the location of the data. Perfect. Thanks. All right, uh, thanks everyone for the, the good discussion. Um, Jeff actually mentioned something that I, I think we haven't emphasized enough, which is the uh, UFS Community Forum. And um, I'll post that in the chat here. Um, I do believe we posted the, the link at least once, um, but we should uh, probably make sure that everybody gets the, the memo. So we do support the UFS community forum, and that's a place for um, users to ask and answer questions about various parts of not just the short range weather app, but other parts of the UFS system. And um, so we definitely encourage uh, users to um, to look over there, especially if you're running into trouble, um, check out one of the uh, getting started or building uh, forums and see if maybe your, your error has been encountered by somebody else before and, and potentially already got an answer. Yep, thanks for mentioning that, Mike. It's extremely important that people use that resource. Okay. Um, seeing no other uh, hands up or questions, I'll move on to the next uh, discussion prompt. Um, so uh, we've already gone over um, sort of developing your own um, grid uh, using a config.sh settings. We did that in the uh, practice sessions. Um, but is there a plan to support more official grids in the future? Because um, currently we only have the, uh, the CONUS domains that are the official supported grids. but um, uh, just thought I'd throw out there, um, is there a plan to uh, create other domains and have those be more official than, uh, than just the CONUS one? 
Yeah, Mike, that's yet another one of my slides for tomorrow for current and future development uh, that I'll go over. Um, but yes, there are, as many other components of the app, uh, many unsupported but available um, things that you can test and run with. And one of those is these uh, additional domain, pre-configured domains. Um, we have um, quite a few of the legacy domains that were uh, available uh, for uh, the wrap the her and the nam uh, and the nam nests. So we have Alaska domains that were run. We have Guam, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, uh, nam nest domains that were run uh, available that you can test. Um, and then we're also looking ahead and I'll, I'll go over this up tomorrow as well, but uh, we're, we're looking ahead for the RFS and uh, we have a North America three kilometer RFS domain, which I won't say is exactly what will be in operations because it may be tweaked but it is very close to probably what will be run in operations that people can use if they'd like. Uh, there's a 13 kilometer coarser version of that if you wanna run it faster, uh, but the same domain. Um, and we have, or we will be implementing a uh, developmental CONUS version of the RFS domain that's gonna be used for uh, DA testing um, and things like that at, at both GS, GSL and EMC. So we'll be adding that as a new predefined option in the future as well. So, so the answer is yes. We, <laughs> we have and will have additional domains uh, that users can, can leverage in the near future and today if they wanted to. All right, thanks, Jeff. Sorry, I should have probably referenced your talk when coming up with my uh, discussion prompts here so I didn't spoil too much. Not a problem. Um, so sort of uh, related to the, the last question. So um, are there any, resources available for sort of guiding people in creating their own domains? Um, for example, uh, how many resources will be needed? I'm gonna ping Gerard on that, since that's right up his alley, if he's available uh, to speak. We, can, we haven't gone through to say, and it's kind of hard because it depends on your machine, but, uh, oh, actually Lin Lin has a, script for that that we can hey Lynn, you want to say something about that if you're there uh is, yeah yeah so i have the script uh, to get the layout to calculate the uh, domain then you can get the lead the uh processor number it's under the oh directory of the code yeah can I ask how that works? Like, does it assume you want to finish your um, simulation in so much wall clock time and calculates back from that or? Yeah, yeah. So when you uh, type in the, the code uh, to run that, the, it will uh, give you the estimation of based on the number of the NX and the NY, then you get the processor. It's mimic our uh, experiment uh, example for the corners domain, so based on 25 kilometer, 13 kilometer, and 3 kilometer. So each setting we have a NX and a NY. So if the user defines their own NX and the NY, then that will compare with our existing experiment and compare the um, processor you needed for the similar machine, then give you an estimation on that. Yeah, thanks, Lin Lin. I, I went ahead and pasted it in the chat. Um, it's it's ush uh, slash get underscore layout, and I just copied in the, the header there in terms of uh, the input and output fields. So you should get a pretty good idea for the layout you need based on your NX and NY and then the number of uh, CPU that is going to be used, so. Yes, thanks. Sure. Uh, Dom, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I've got a question and it's actually, I think going towards Lucas, um, <clears throat> usually when you have a model then at some point parallelism just breaks down or parallel performance breaks down because the <clears throat> communication overhead becomes more than, than what you gain by adding more tasks. And is there a, <clears throat> a rough figure, a rough number like 100 grid columns per MPI task before, before this breaks down or, or do you have any information on that? It's actually much less than that um, because uh, we actually did a, uh, some uh, massive scaling tests as part of the NGGPS selection process. 
and for both 13 kilometers and a global three kilometer domain. And I believe we're getting, if you, with the appropriate use of, uh, of OpenMP threading, you can get scaling out to uh, very large numbers of cores. Even at our, in our C96 100 kilometer uh, domain, if you use OpenMP, you can effectively get scaling out to many thousands of cores. Um, and we were able to scale to the size of Edison, 110,000 cores with the global three kilometer domain back in 2015. So there's some information hey, about tough. that on our uh, website. I can uh, pass along the link uh, if, if, yeah, when I find it. Yeah, that's great because, uh, yeah, I mean, OpenMP is of course a different thing. I was just wondering about pure MPI, but that's good to know. <clears throat> okay, thank you. All right, everyone, thanks for, thanks for that. Um, the next question for discussion. So if you're doing say real-time experiments, um, what would be the best way to get data fast for real-time runs, especially for people who don't necessarily have access to tier one platforms with HPSS access and things like that? The cloud. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I mean, you can pull, if you're doing one of the real-time runs, you can pull files off of Nomads. Sometimes there's a latency there. Um, however, a lot of, uh, private sector folks are mirroring or pulling data over from Nomads onto uh, various cloud service providers. And so you can actually find basically a copy of uh, nomads on cloud. Uh, so for things like GFS outputs that you may need to drive the SRW app. Um, I will dig up a link and drop that into Slack um, once I've done that, but that, that would be my suggestion. I don't know if others have anything else they'd like to add. Um, thanks for the answer, Jacob. Um, it does seem like the the cloud is brought up more and more often, um, and that's a certainly a good resource that uh, we will hopefully learn a bit more about tomorrow with uh, some talks on that regard. Okay, um, this uh, was actually a question that was asked earlier, um, and I. It, again, I didn't see there was an answer in Slack, so it may have been answered already verbally, but I'm not sure. Um, so has the forecast performance uh, regarding the original GFDL cube grid and the new more uniform uh, ESG grid, has that been compared in with regards to performance and accuracy? Mike, can you repeat that one again? Sorry. Uh, sorry, sure. Um, so there was a, with the original uh, GFDL cube, uh, cube sphere grid versus the ESG grid, um, has the performance um, of that been compared both for say computational performance and accuracy? So I thought, I, I thought that uh, Jim Purser and or others at EMC who were involved in, in the manuscript work on ESG grid were planning to run some tests and maybe we at, at GSL, Gerard, I can't remember, um, we didn't actually say who was going to do it, but I think we were going to contribute to that effort, but I'm, I'm not sure where things stand with that at the moment, but there were plans to, to actually do some quantitative comparisons between the two for that manuscript. I, I haven't yes. done such tests, but maybe Jacob knows. Yeah, the work is planned uh, to compare the, um, traditional Schmidt mnemonic and the extended Schmidt mnemonic. Um, it's, it's on our, uh, it's, it's on our, on our desk. It's on our list of things to do. We do have some initial results, um, that aren't quite ready for prime time. Um, there are some advantages, uh, to using the grid. Um, one is, you know, you, the uh, additional uniformity that you get means that you can optimize things like setting your time step. 
uh, a little bit more uh, easily uh, since you're not, since uh, in the conventional uh, approach of doing things, the coarsest area would be in the center of the grid and the finest resolution would kind of be near the edges and near the corners. And so you'd have to basically set your time step up such that, you know, it was consistent with the uh, smallest or uh, 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 cell sizes near those domain edges. And with the uh, more uh, uniform grid, you know, you have, uh, you know, more uniformity really. Uh, so you're able to optimize the uh, computational aspects a little bit more easily there. Um, in addition, you know, you actually get, you also get more resolution, uh, you know, a little bit finer, I would say, resolution when you, especially with larger domains, I should say, uh, when you are specifying uh, your parameters with the extended Schmidt mnemonic projection. I'll see if I can poke around and find an example or two on the side here. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, Lucas, Thanks. I see your hand is up as well. Uh, I don't know if you, what you had to add to that. Yeah, the uh, the time step issue is probably the biggest uh, the biggest nicety of the excellent ESG grid. Um, I I don't know where the name GFDL cube grid came from, but um, uh, another reference is actually uh, Tom Black before he retired at EM from EMC. He published a great paper uh, comparing the uh, global global nested versus the limited area domain, and uh, found that the degradation was minimal in the first uh, I believe it was forty eight to sixty hours. Um, and so if you're doing a short range forecast, then yeah, the, the computational benefits alone, uh, both the, the, lack, the lack of a global, the, the need not to have to run a global domain in the limited area model and the time step together uh, give you considerable computational benefits. So if you are interested in just a 48 hour forecast, the limited area domain gives you a great uh, performance advantage. It's a lot easier to use. Uh, it's a lot easier to design. And of course you also get the further time step benefits by using the, the nice ESG grid. Great, that's uh, great to hear those those results. So it seems like uh, at least there's a uh, certainly advantages to using the the ESG over the the previous version. Okay, um, with no more follow up on that topic, I'll move on to the the next uh, discussion prompt. Um, and this was uh, th this is um, specifically talking about the short range weather app. So, is there any sort of restart capability at at the app level in order to continue a previous forecast, or uh, would it have to be sort of uh, re rerun the app from scratch? Yeah, that's been on our list of things that we wanted to get into the app for a while, among a ton of other things, but. Um, it's relatively straightforward to restart um, based on a restart file. So, you know, the development work to get that into the app is fairly minimal. Um, again, it, it will hopefully go in in the near future. I will say that um, that's been standard operating procedure for the cycling runs that have been taking place at, for the RFS prototypes at EMC and at GSL for a long time. So they have it uh, in their forks of the app. Um, so it, it's, it works. Um, and users can do it. Um, it's unsupported at the moment, uh, but it, again, is something that we would like to get into the official app in, in the near future. Oh, one thing I did want to briefly point out is that and I didn't have time for it in my talk on Tuesday, but in my extra slides, I do have a, a brief discussion on how to restart, uh, uh, to, to do a restart. It's uh, basically you move files from one of the run directories into another directory, and then you make a couple of uh, changes to the uh, run script. Um, both uh, the FD3 dynamical core and CCPP should be able to support uh, restarts pretty seamlessly. Thanks for that, Lucas. And yeah, I'll just remind people that um, you on the agenda page, you should be able to find links to all the other uh, presentations, including um, Lucas, I assume these bonus slides would have been included in there. They should have been. I uploaded the uh, final version just after my talk. All right, that's great. Okay. And um, if you are 
looking for that agenda page and you don't have it, you can find it in Slack and we'll, we'll also uh, send some follow-up information uh, in an email after the, after the training is complete. Um, here's another uh, question, uh, not seeing any more hands up. Um, is, the, uh, is there any plan so, uh, to include um, a WARF-like nesting capability in the short range weather app? Or is that even, even possible right now? Um, I'm going to put Jacob on the spot here. I, I thought that there were UFS R2O plans, or maybe I'm not thinking in the right location. But I thought I read something somewhere about a desire to get a nesting capability into the lamb at some point. Um, so yep. maybe. Yeah, it's okay. needed for hats. Uh, there is a nesting capability that's needed for hats. Okay. It's being worked on. Uh, I see Lucas has his hand up, so I'm going to pass the hot potato over to him. Okay, th thanks, Jacob. Yeah, so we we just uh, we just uh, transitioned this, or uh, I guess we tra not look at yeah, the exact word is escaping me, but uh, yes, it is in with the uh, the latest uh, code that's been uh, transferred to EMC, and uh, our partners at EMC, especially Ben Liu, are, are working on it. On working on, uh, they've taken the code that does do that, and they're working on integrating it within halves right now, so it should be available to the SRW uh, uh, community relatively soon. That's great, does, thanks. Yeah, and this does include the multiple end telescopic nesting in both the regional and the global domains. And if folks don't know what HAP stands for, it's Hurricane Analysis and Forecast System, and it's the follow-on to HWARF and HMON, which are the currently operational uh, hurricane systems running in the NSEP production suite right now. So that's also under the UFS umbrella, same dynamic core and all that. Yeah, this is this is the beauty of doing it the UFS way because the HEFS the HEFS code is developed in the same uh, in the same uh, code repository with the same code as the standalone regional, and so it's it's all one single software stack. So uh, in the future, once we get uh, to uh, closer to where we want to be, uh, this capability that we now have with the hurricane models for doing uh, moving telescoping nests is basically available everywhere in any regional application. And so particularly uh, if we are talking about uh, not only doing the rapid refresh forecast system as a consolidation of the HER and the NAM and a whole bunch of systems, but if we are wanting to do a one on forecast with higher resolution even than that, the only way to do that is to, uh, at the moment with the resources we have, is to do that with a relocatable and potentially telescoping nest. And so the, the UFS is bringing all these capabilities into a single software stack. And so you can start cross using all these technologies that are now only available in, in separate applications. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that uh, come to fruition. And once, once the HAFS is matured and all these things are uh, available in the same code stack and therefore available in the, in the, uh, in, uh, the standalone re uh, regional or the short range better too, but need a little bit of patience there. Um, thanks, Hendrik. Uh, Gili, I see your hand just went up. Yeah, so just a question for Lucas. So the, uh, I believe there's also vertical nesting also already available in the latest uh, code, research code. Oh, yes. So the code uh, does not require having the same vertical levels on, the, on a parent and its nest. Um, the only requirement is that the nested grid has a lower top than its parent. Thanks. Yep, otherwise it's arbitrary. Um, I can't guarantee stability for using a radically different set of vertical levels between the two uh, domains, but we have tested it with a, like a GFS like 63 levels on the parent and uh, a 75 level domain used in half halves on the nest and it works beautifully. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great to hear. It sounds like there's a lot of exciting uh, nesting related development coming through the pipeline. Um, Hendrik, uh, did you have another thing to add or was your hand still up from last time? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for your, for your contributions there. Um, 
the uh, the next question uh, may uh, have the uh, maybe sparking some discussion um, and may not be answerable at this time. But uh, when what might we expect the next supported release of the UFS short range weather app? Um, that is a great question and um, something that we have discussed fairly extensively in the last year or so, at least ever since we got the first one released in March. Um, it takes a pretty big undertaking. I mean, we worked on that release for the better part of a year. Uh, so um, there was some discussion that we might want to hold off a little while for the second release until we're at least closer to uh, having an RRFS configuration that is likely to go into operations. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it might be another year and a half. Um, it also depends on NOAA management. Um, but my understanding is that uh, those uh, above me feel that, um, you know, we, we should pause things for a little while, let the community um, run with the first release and get a feel for the app. Um, and then again, as we get closer to the first uh, implementation of the RFS, then will likely be the time for a, a, another, another release. Jacob or Hendrik, if you guys wanted to comment, feel free. Yeah, I decided to raise my hand for that one since you, managed, since you mentioned management, although I'm technically not that anymore. Uh, it's it's not a it's not an isolated question. It's a question in general. Uh, we want to we want to make sure that we get a very representative set of releases for all kinds of applications in the UFS out. And like uh, that was just said a little earlier, this is not cheap, particularly the first time around. And so uh, we are hoping to do one or two more releases over the next year, but we haven't made a decision yet on a, on a more general level whether that is going to be an upgrade for. Uh, the medium range to a fully coupled system or whether it's a second release for a more RFS focused for the medium range or whether it's a half swan. So uh, the only thing I can say at this time is, yes, we know that we need to do these things, but uh, stay tuned. There's, uh, we, we need to figure out what the actual resources available are. Also, uh, we need to figure out how well uh, things like Epic can actually help us with that. And that will take a little bit. Uh, it's nice to see that on paper, but we want to see that actually test run on uh, with boots on the ground for a little while too. So stay tuned. No hard answer yet. Sorry about that. No, yeah, thanks. It's it's good to know that that we are uh, uh, certainly moving forward, but um, you know, it's understandable that with the the scale of the UFS that these uh, releases are certainly not coming out every month. Um, but that's, a, I guess, another way, reason to point out uh, to users that, yeah, once we have, once you have comfort with the actual released code, um, we do uh, encourage you to at least take a look at the, uh, the more up-to-date developed versions um, because all this developed, just because we're not releasing the code in these official releases doesn't mean there isn't lots of work and development going on. And, these are also opportunities to contribute. Absolutely. Are you volunteering, Jacob? Oh, I, I, I have enough to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I have actually reached the end of my uh, discussion prompt questions. Um, and it looks like we have like uh, 20, 25 minutes left. Um, I'd like to invite any of the, uh, the attendees, uh, the trainees, um, just to ask any questions. We, like, we have uh, many of the presenters and uh, subject matter experts here today. So certainly, certainly don't be shy to uh, uh, put, our, put our knowledge to the test. And I guess I'll, I'll invite any of the other uh, 
presenters and subject matter experts. Um, just if you'd like to put out any call to action or questions or statements, just to give an idea of the the next generation of who's going to be uh, who's going to be contributing and using the the UFS. What what you'd like to say to them? Um, Iman, I see you have a hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, just wanted to thank everyone because it's, it's a great opportunity you know, so far in the last three days. You know, personally, I've learned a lot. Looking forward to future development. But just one general question again about you know, UFS. Like looking at overarching UFS platform, basically a future plan from short term to going to years longer. Iman, I, I think you may have uh, leaned away from your microphone. I, I think you faded oh. away at the end there. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Um, so looking at the UFS, I'm hoping the, the sound is all right now. Oh, so. Yes. Yeah, good. So is there any plan to have some overarching kind of post-processing, like seamlessness in the product, like UFS as one product at the end? It's more machine learning or stats kind of question. It's not really modeling, but I'm wondering if somewhere in the plan there is some kind of vision to blend all this various product together to make it more coherent. Well, I have to UFS, exactly. um, the, sh the short answer is yes, uh, in the sense that uh, there's basically two types of post processing that we're looking at. One of one is the UPP that we already talked about today. Uh, the other is that uh, with everything that we're doing, moving towards uh, an ensemble base, either a single model ensemble or a multi-model ensemble, uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in getting a lot better um, uh, output out of your modeling system for very little extra cost by doing statistical post-processing. At this point, we do not have a accepted uh, unified framework for that, but it is something that we've been looking at and that we're looking at designing. And once that uh, unified uh, framework is in place, then I'm pretty sure that uh, statistical post-processing, including mixing outcomes from different uh, different applications and things like that, uh, will become a part of the UFS. But that's one of the three or four things that are still big gaps that we are trying to figure out how to fill them. Thank you. And on the on the back side of that, uh, NOAA does have a uh, AI machine learning strategy, and uh, that has been published. Uh, we are starting to build a uh, NOAA AI center at uh, at NASDAQ at NCEI. And um, from the weather service side, we've been pushing hard to make sure that uh, our model outputs go in uh, into uh, the public databases in such a way that they are searchable and usable for AI and ML techniques. And so not sure how fast that is going to go because the um, initial uh, attempt to get uh, explicit funding for that, I believe has uh, been delayed until next year. But uh, uh, the idea that NOAA in general is much more interested in, uh, in doing AI and machine learning uh, is certainly applicable to what we want to do with statistical post-processing for as an integral part of uh, of the UFS. And there are some uh, JTTI and other NOAA funding opportunities that have already been funding uh, techniques to uh, to get more information out of our model output through AI and uh, machine learning. So we're moving that way slowly but surely. And if people think that this is really new, the first thing of uh, artificial intelligence that went into operations uh, was a in, uh, with uh, the weather service was a retrieval algorithm for the SSMI uh, instruments, that is now 26 years ago. So AI is not that new. Yeah, Hendrik, I'll just add that um, we see quite a few um, promising AI techniques and machine learning techniques uh, every year at HWT and Norman. And so uh, there are quite a few developers that are, are doing that within NOAA, NCAR, CIRA at CSU, uh, CU at Ceres, um, and I'm sure other locations, other universities as well. So um, it's exploded in the last five, 10 years. So I am sure that we will be seeing a lot more of that in post-processing in the near future. 
Yeah, and to go back to my own old stamping, stamping grounds, a few years back we had uh, some uh, visitors that uh, worked at EMC that showed that um, if you would use the wave model ensemble that uh, we had, instead of just using traditional uh, averaging and statistical techniques, if you would use an AI technique to get the best information out of that, you got massively better uh, 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 um, forecast products than you would get from uh, the older methods. So yeah, there's no doubt in my mind. And uh, I actually did a, a TED talk uh, in November on innovations in weather forecasting, and that specifically uh, points towards the UFS. It points to social and behavioral sciences and dealing with that. And it points to uh, AI and machine learning. If you're interested in that, that is on uh, TEDx Georgetown was uh, published in November. Yeah, that's that's great to hear all this uh, innovation and cutting edge uh, things that are seemingly just just on the edge of the waterfall coming coming down into the UFS pipeline. So it's definitely exciting times, and it's it it really kind of hammers home like I think we've already said several times just the the amazing benefits of of the UFS as a unified system where one if one part improves, uh, you just take that and apply it somewhere else. Um, Jacob, I don't know if you had something to say. I, I'm not sure if you just turned your camera on or I forgot that it was on. No, I, I turned it on a little while ago and then I've just been doing a lot of head nodding since. Okay. I, th I thought you were showing us that you had too much spare time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I guess what I really want to say is uh, this is really exciting. Um, I'll give a talk tomorrow on the plans for the rapid refresh system and how everything fits in, how this particular application fits into the broader picture of the onset production suite. Um, but I, I think what I'm really excited about here is it's a, a just a, a really fantastic way for us to stay connected from the operational context um, with what folks, which some of the new and exciting things that people are doing out in, in outside of, you know, whatever we're doing at, at, uh, at NOAA and at EMC. Um, so, you know, we all can benefit uh, uh, in that way, both from innovations coming out of what we're doing for operational NWP and then out to research community and then vice versa. So, um, you know, just just really very excited about it and to do it all, all under this kind of unified framework is is really great. So more to more on that tomorrow. Yeah, thank, thanks for touching on that, Jacob. And yeah, that's a that's a good point is that I, I I feel like we can't say it enough that um, these sorts of training and tutorial events are, are really, it, it's, you know, the benefits to the training, training attendees is obvious, but us as uh, instructors and um, developers and uh, code managers and things like that, um, we benefit from this a lot as well. And whether it's through the, the questions that you all are answer, asking or the ideas that you're throwing at us, um, we, we do really appreciate all the all the input and feedback that we've gotten from you all this week. So um, definitely a, a big thanks to all the attendees and, and hopefully uh, you won't uh, give up on us and we'll, we'll continue, uh, continue not only tomorrow with the, tomorrow's talks, but um, in the future in the uh, development world. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, second, third or fourth or fifth that easily. Uh, this is uh, absolutely well done. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I, I want to, I want to make, one other point, a little bit more of a philosophical one. Uh, we, we've been, been complaining about the fact that uh, the big computers are not built for us anymore. They're built for other things. Uh, we've been complaining about the fact that uh, young kids out of college uh, prefer to go into the gaming industry rather than writing Fortran. I don't know why. Uh, and all kinds of other good stuff like that. Uh, but um, uh, we, we're talking about, about being able to have a little bit broader community here to work with us of established people. But the fact that literally a student, not a professor, a student can pick up your code right now and start playing with it pretty much in a day is what I hope is going to change our quote unquote recruitment problem that we have as a community. The fact that it's gonna be so much more simple for the really young generations right now to get get uh, <laughs> the bug-free 
bug from being able to run a uh, run run something like this on their own computer in an environment that uh, the the newer generations are much more uh, much more uh, enticed into. And it's going to be really interesting to see how, what this means for inflow of new talent in our, our our group too. And so, when you think you're doing a good job here for just helping out. Uh, with getting some uh, old fogies like me and like Russell Morrison and others to to uh, get to work with some newer tools and toys, I think the impact of this is actually going to be much bigger in terms of us recruiting next generations of people who want to work in this field, because because that was pretty much impossible before, and it now becomes a real reality. And I want to want to give some kudos to Enrique Alves, a good old friend of mine, an old wave modeler, who who made that statement about a year ago, and he says. What if you take these um, graduate student tests and these uh, releases, and you have every AMF stu AMS student uh, charter uh, reach out to them and have them play with this? What would that do to the amount of people and students that we retain in our field and stuff like that? So, looking forward to that too. Much broader though. Thanks. And thank you, Hendrik. Yes. So we have about uh, about 10 minutes left in the q and A. I'll just put out a, a final call for questions if anyone has any. I know it's a, a very long week and it's it's very late in the day or or early depending on where you are in the in the world. Um, but yeah, thank you for thank you for attending and uh, and making it this far and and all the contributions that everyone has has a uh, given so far, both on the, the train, trainees and the trainers. Yeah, thanks everybody. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And Thank so, you. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, Mike. Oh no, I think that was uh, your echo. Thanks. Oh, okay. Mike. Yeah, I was just going to thank you, Mike, for for leading the discussion session and for everyone's questions and contributions so far. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. everybody. And uh, I guess good job. Without seeing any other uh, any other questions or comments, uh, we'll dismiss for the day and we can reconvene at, uh, it should be 9 a.m. Mountain Time tomorrow, um, where we'll see some talks about the future of the UFS. Um, thanks, everybody. <laughs>